ure nama ke nama ke uri da uwanya Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Michael and I'll be your host uh, for today. I am from Guyana in South America and I am of the Patamona people. I, I hope that today you are as excited as I am to participate in this last day of our activity. Um, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you from wherever you may be joining us today, from the Amazon basin, from uh, the Mesoamerica, from Indonesia, Amman, and from all around the world, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. And we hope that you have as much fun as we do. Uh, we believe that in all of this, even though it's a lot of fun, you'd be able to learn as much as uh, we too can learn because we believe that we can learn from each other's experiences. So I hope that today we can pay some attention and focus and ask questions when the time comes. Um, but before we get into our program for today, I'd like to uh, go through and remind everyone of some housekeeping rules. Uh, so that we have the activity flow as smooth as we can. Um, while we understand that there may be times when we have some technical difficulties, we hope that you can help us to um, go through this and make this as smooth as possible and ensure that we have a great day today. So um, I'd like to ask the panelists in making your presentations, if you can speak as slowly as possible. And the reason for this is that because we have translators uh, into Spanish, Portuguese, and English. So anyone can feel free to join our uh, Zoom uh, chat and select the language of your choice. If you are able to, to join, you can, you can select your language. So down at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will find an interpretation icon. You click on that and then you select the language of your choice and you will be able to follow the proceedings in your own language. Um, additionally, if you have questions, there is a Q&A section down below. In the Q&A section, you can type your uh, questions. Um, if there is a specific panelist that you'd like to answer your question, then you can address it specifically to that panelist and that panelist will answer your question. But you can also put uh, generalized questions as well in the Q&A. So use the Q&A for your questions. Uh, try not to put them into the regular chat, but use the Q&A. Um, in that way, we will ensure that uh, our panelists get them and that they'd be able to view and answer your uh, questions. Um, so all of the events here will be recorded so that we can play them back in the future for others who may have missed it today. So we just want you to know that the, 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 rec uh, the recordings will be available and it will be available later on. We have uh, indigenous bloggers who are sharing their, their, not their local perspectives on our village.us. So if you want to tune in and find out what our indigenous bloggers are doing, you can also go to our village.us to see what is happening. So we want to ensure that we have as much participation as we can into this activity. So welcome to our village. You know, it's about connectivity and about networking and 
with a solutions focus. So here we're looking to find solutions. So it's not just about having discussions, but about finding solutions uh, to the issues that we uh, bring up. So this activity is organized by, if not us, then who, in partnership with the Hip Hop Caucus and the Guardians of the Forest. The Guardians of the Forest are indigenous peoples and territorial communities from around the Amazon basin, so Brazil, Indonesia, Mesoamerica, and they represent the guardians of over 400 million hectares of forests. That's tropical forests around the world. So this is quite a lot of uh, forests we're talking about here. So they advocate for the respect of territorial rights and the inclusion of their demands in global negotiations on forest and climate change. Their alliance is made up of four territorial organizations. We have the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago, AMAN, and this is in Indonesia. We have the Mesoamerican Alliance of Peoples and Forests, AMPB, and this is located in Central America. We have the Articulation of Indigenous Peoples of Brazil, APIB, and we also have the Coordinator of Indigenous Peoples Organizations in the Amazon Basin, COICA. So we have several uh, uh, groups which are included in the uh, in the guardians of the forest so i just want you to know that this activity it's a live and free flowing so we go along as you know things happen and this is why we want you uh, to participate and you know feel free to uh, engage us because it's all about engagement like we said before it's about connectivity it's about connecting people it's about networking but it's also a solutions focus activity so like i said keep that in mind as we go through today so we have a panel coming up the next panel uh, the first panel of today is uh, reinventing reforestation. And it's about leveraging blockchain and direct financing to support Amazon indigenous led reforestation and conservation. And it will premiere a new short film. Your host today is uh, Tom Buick, and he is from the Rainforest Foundation. So, Tom Buick is currently in Peru, but he works uh, with the Rainforest uh, Foundation US, and he's been doing quite a lot of work down in Peru over the last couple of years. So, so I'll hand you over to Tom Buick, who will take you into the next uh, activity. Tom. Thank you, Michael. Uh, nice to see you um, uh, this way, at least. It's been a while since uh, uh, last September. First of all, thanks to everybody for coordinating this. And hello from Lima Quarantine. After, um, what are we on, day 100 or so? And uh, just briefly, we are uh, going to, so Rainforest Foundation, just for those of you who don't know our work, we work with directly with indigenous organizations and communities um, around the Amazon Tropical Basin, along with Rainforest Foundation K and Rainforest Foundation Norway. And what we're gonna to discuss today, as Michael mentioned, is uh, a, a new initiative that we have been uh, developing and is in progress. And this is based on work of previously where we empower communities to use technology and satellite data that is from platforms such as the World Resources Institute, uh, Global Forest Watch, we have early satellite alerts, uh, the communities have are equipped with smartphones that have maps in the uh, in the phones, which you'll see in the video. And we've been working with over 50 communities in Peru with this initiative alone, particularly with a random control trial study, which we carried out with uh, uh, under the with Orpio, the Organization of Indigenous People of the Eastern Amazon which is covers the entire uh, department of Laredo from the border of Ecuador towards the border of, uh, of, of uh, Peru, the tri-border, Peru, Colombia, Brazil. And the, what we've seen over the last three years implementing or five years really implementing this is that indigenous communities on the ground level have adapted very quickly to this uh, new technology. As the technology evolves, the communities have adapted, you know, the new tools. And uh, significantly, with the study, this 
uh, work has demonstrated significantly that communities using this monitoring tool with their collective territories and using collective governance in very many cases, as you'll see in the video, and as Francisco will discuss, have virtually eliminated deforestation from rates as high as five to 10% annually to virtually zero. And we got to a point where, as the study concluded, and then kind of what's next, how do we turn the page, uh, particularly with the pilot community uh, area and the tribe border of Brazil and Colombia, what uh, what's the next step? Well, that is that they can recuperate what has been lost. And meanwhile, adapt the same technologies that successfully empower the communities to eliminate deforestation from uh, invasions, coca, mining, uh, illegal logging, you name it, it's all represented in this area. Every kind of threat, which some like Michael's aware of as well, and all of you. And we now with the next step is, okay, what about reforesting? Uh, saving forest that, it, that is intact still. And then compensation for that. There are a lot of initiatives globally out there uh, that fund uh, tree planting. There's red. There are a lot of initiatives. And what we have found, or someone like me working on the ground, is often these resources don't reach communities directly who actually do the work. They have the territory, they take the risk. And so this initiative, which you, which you will see in the video, is one to that we're working with to empower them to turn that page, rather than being reactive to threats to be proactive and reforest, which we all know is imperative to solving the climate crisis. And meanwhile, we need what well, we want the financing to you know, support to directly reach communities. That's why, for example, the Regeneration Network and, and, and Ron will speak uh, a, a bit later in the panel uh, to have a platform so people can see, can uh, 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 donate or invest in this work, and that that financing reaches communities on the ground who are doing the work. They're planting trees, they're conserving forests, they're monitoring their forests, and that that can be document ev documented, evidence based with the same technology that these communities have used been using for years uh, to document illegal activity or, or deforestation. Now it can evidence the fact that the work is happening and connect communities to programs or investors or the private sector through a platform such as the, the Regeneration Network and, and, and really empower communities to manage their own, um, the, the, their own collective territories and forests and then see the reward for that which they deserve because everybody is, talks about how important it is to save the rainforest. The people in this video and uh, Francisco Hernandez, who will speak in a bit, uh, are the ones there on the front lines. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now and, and, and uh, allow the video and Francisco and, and Ron to, to, to uh, speak further to the issues. fecha ha habido alguna alerta posterior a nuestra visita ya no ya no, no ha habido más no había, no, no había más nada ya esas talas de madera también que hubo ya paralizó mi nombre es pablo garcía cahuasa soy secretario y como segundo apoyo de la comunidad 
El primer paso del, es el monitoreo. Ahora estamos al segundo paso ya este, creciendo. Listo, señores. Conformado nuestro comité. Usted tiene que ponerse de acuerdo cuál de esos territorios que está acá, en este bosque, de dónde a dónde es que usted van a proteger. Demarquen cuál es lo que ustedes van a, a conservar. Gracias a ese bosque que nosotros, la comunidad que vamos a cuidar, vamos a tener este, un beneficio económico y con ese beneficio económico vamos a sembrar. Todos están queriendo, están poniendo de su parte, querer recuperar las cosas, puede ser, ya muchos años se ha perdido. Pueden reforestar, ya, han entendido, pueden reforestar. ¿Qué vas a sembrar, hermano? Castaña. Castaña. Pienso sembrar cedro y castaña. Tornillo y cedro. La caoba y, y la castaña. Allá bajamos el pisco yambo. Tengo dos hectáreas de cacao. Y pienso sembrar cedro y cacao. Cedro y cacao. Cedro y cacao. No, no. Cedro y cacao. Cedro y cacao. Esto es lo que está en rojo. Es lo que no encontramos acá. Podemos traer de otro lugar. La finalidad de poder encontrarnos aquí en esta oportunidad en la comunidad nativa de Buen Jardín, de Callarú, es por el propósito de traer 500 plantones para la venta del bosque de, de esta hermosa comunidad de Buen Jardín. Con cuidado, con cuidado. Semillas, que lo que, no, que ustedes no tienen, nosotros vamos a llevar allá para que ustedes también se si siembre, mejor este. Claro. Capirona, capirona. Es de mandarina. Le estoy este, colocando toda la etiqueta, el arbolito que es el cedro para el sembrío del señor Hammer. Pero tiene que ahí, 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 entonces en una reunión entre nosotros nos hemos puesto de acuerdo en empezar en personas que tienen mayor necesidad que otras. ¡No, vamos por otro lado! Yo me llamo Hammer Pisco Yambo. Yo tengo cinco hijos. Aparte que, que tengo, tengo seis centenas. Para mantener a mis hijos tengo que trabajar, rebuscarme ¿ya? en otras partes. Porque si no rebusco, ¿qué me va a dar? la comida las bendiciones que ahorita estamos plantando los cítricos para poder ya vender a otra parte con eso vamos a poder a mantener ellos hacer estudiar a otra parte algo que, que siempre nos une a todos nosotros es las mingas hacer unas mingas en una cantidad de familias que son muchas trabajar es, es muy rápida, es muy excelente. Ellos son para medir 6 por 6, 6 por 6 es la... Siempre se hacía, pero ya con el tiempo ya nos hemos este, dejando, pero hoy en día pues nos toca nuevamente trabajar así, unidos, para que todos tengamos las cosas que queremos. Ya, el, las plantas están sembradas, Ahí viene el tema del monitoreo a las plantas, mediante el satélite, ¿no? Vamos a tomar foto a la plantita para ver la coordenada y la altura. Es importante evidenciar para que el mundo y todos los financieros vean que nosotros estamos haciendo, no solamente deforestar, también estamos reforestando que hay varias comunidades que también están en esa, misma, en esa misma mira y entonces yo creo que con esta iniciativa vamos a hacer una réplica en las demás comunidades. Lo más increíble ha sido que la gente desconfiaba, ¿no? pero lo que me gustaba es que se volvieron a, a unir. Al ver el día de ayer que se volvieron a unir, que trabajamos en grupo, es algo bonito.
Okay. Um, thank you for watching the video. Yeah, as Paul said, this will be, uh, this is a draft and we will uh, publish this video soon. And it's an ongoing story. This is a, a, a long-term initiative. And uh, we find it particularly inspiring that the communities are working together as was shown in the video and Pancho will, uh, uh, Francisco Hernandez, the president of the uh, Yagua and Tacuna uh, peoples in the tri border area where the pilot was shot, will speak now uh, 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 regarding how he feels about it in the future of this initiative and why it's important to him. Uh, Francisco, are you there? Assess? We've been having some technical difficulties with Francisco. He's in the middle of the jungle. And I'm going to, Francisco, can you, Francisco, puedes, um, Prender tu video y, y recófono para compartir. Otherwise, I'm going to call him. Um, I, I think he has, he has to log out and log in again. It's not it's not working. He doesn't have any audio. So okay. Let's, let's wait a bit, see if he comes him. back. Okay, I'm trying to call him. We've been having, it's difficult to put this together sometimes. I really want his voice to be heard. And he's uh trying hard as well so i will hello pancho perhaps go to ron tom while we're waiting okay um sure ron maybe you could uh, maybe you can jump in and and uh and and, and speak about the the role of the what region uh, network does and the platform and why we are working together and your vision overall and why um, you know what inspires you to work with us in this project this uh, groundbreaking initiative of direct financing for for results sounds good good morning everyone uh, my name is ron standards um, i'm a product lead in region network and we're super excited to be working with uh the Indigenous Communities and the Rainforest Foundation. Um, I have a few slides to share to speak a bit about our work. Can you guys see the share? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, we all know the um, situation on Earth is. Um, just give me one second here. We all know the situation on Earth is uh, is grim. Twenty seventeen report from uh, FAO mentioned we have fifty seven harvests left. Nutrient topsoil is becoming scarce at an alarming rate, and to date we have lost more than half of Earth's original rainforest. At this pace, we'll. Um, uh, lose all of our rainforest in our lifetime. There's unprecedented uh, extinction and decline in, in the species we're seeing. And we're all experiencing uh, extreme weather patterns in a much more uh, frequent basis. But as you can see on the right side, not everything is grim. Agriculture and, and conservation have great potential to reverse these trends. Um, shifting to Regenerative agriculture uh, or sustainable agriculture and conservation, though, challenges it's expensive. And land stewards, um, like the indigenous folks, are not provided the much needed incentives they need. So there's a great need for increase in, in climate financing. Governments and corporations are beginning to hear this call and, and are making big climate commitments, which is really great. Um, 183 countries signed the Paris Accord. Uh, there's over 1,200 corporations that have made uh, public announcements on reducing their environmental impact. Uh, so there's a huge need for solutions. Um, the challenges that existing market mechanisms, for instance, carbon credits, are, uh, are problematic, um, especially when it comes to nature-based solutions. They're costly, um, they're tangled rules and regulations, uh, 
that require many intermediaries. And they rely usually on very complicated monitoring and verification systems. <clears throat> also, they lack transparency. So donors or funders really uh, have a hard time um, seeing the actual work on the ground. Uh, Region Network is here to solve that. We're, we're building a new platform called Region uh, Registry. Uh, it's a next generation ecosystem service registry that connects climate committed funders and land stewards on the ground like these indigenous folks. Our system is geared to significantly reduce the, the cost of nature-based solutions uh, by tapping into some technical technologies and I'll show in a bit uh, like remote sensing and IoT and you've seen drones in the, in the video. Um, streamlining the tangled set of monitoring, reporting and verification requirements I mentioned and providing much needed trust through using scientifically rigorous methodologies and completing um, and, and transparency into the underlying ecological data that we're, we store on, this, on the system and provide. Our, reg <coughs> um, our registry is, uh, region registry is built on top of uh, uh, what we call region ledger, uh, which is uh, a public ecological ledger, ledger based on blockchain technology. Um, this technology allows us to do different things. Uh, allows us to issue innovative ecosystem service credits without the need for expensive intermediaries. Uh, we can also execute automatic direct payments to those land stewards, to those indigenous communities in this case, based on measurable outcomes. And we, we can create a trusted public and global ecological marketplace with it. So we're really excited about the platform here. And we're also seeing a lot of excitement from land stewards. So far, we've already um, had 200, uh, more than 200 land stewards signed up in our platform. Um, they in total represent more than 16 million acres. Um, and this is uh, all over the world. So switching a bit more to focus on, on, the, uh, on the work here, agriculture is a, is a big part of the solution, um, but protecting and growing our forests is, is another key part. Uh, protecting our forests would solve one third of the climate crisis, uh, which is an incredible number. And 25% of these forests are indigenous lands. The problem as, as um, Tom mentioned before, very little direct funding actually reaches those frontline communities, uh, which are desperately in need and resources to actually do their job in protecting our planet. And so that's why we're really uh, excited to be working here with Tom and the communities. Um, our goal here is to really prevent deforestation and fund uh, the, the next, the, the, the phase two, the reforestation of the, the previously degraded areas. Here you can see a, a map. Uh, you got a glimpse of it also in the video of, of the community um, in uh, the Loreto area. And the idea is to start there and then learn from that and expand to other communities uh, in total representing 30,000 hectares. And beyond that, it's uh, largely applicable to you know, other areas in the Amazon basin. So a little bit about how this is gonna work. Um, in this case, one part in the Cairo, the community along with Rainforest Foundation are gonna form a collective agreement and establish a project on region registry. Um, they use the satellite imagery, uh, Global Forest Watch that uh, <clears throat> they've been using for several years, collecting, um, documentation about any potential illegal activity. And then they also uh, use drones to track and the uh, tracking of, of the reforestation um, of um, new plants and trees. And then funders can see uh, all this data on our platform and they can donate directly to the project and that money goes to the community based on that evidence. This gives you a glimpse of um, the project page that we set up on uh, region registry. Uh, it'll give an overview of, of the community, uh, of uh, their work, uh, a map. Uh, you can also see photos and, and videos. Uh, the part that's not included in this screenshot, uh, you'll actually be able to see all the evidence that the community has been collecting along with uh, the satellite imagery. So uh, if you're a funder, you can actually see directly uh, evidence of uh, the work on the ground and, and and the impact of your dollars. This is sort of to get a glimpse of potential with uh, remote sensing. Um, it's not for this particular um, case right now. Initially, we'll probably use drones uh, while the trees are um, 
are small. Uh, eventually, we can use uh, other technologies. In this case, um, we're using Sentinel, which is uh, European Space Agency imagery. And you can see on the right here, evidence in red of deforestation. On the left, uh, evidence of um, afforestation or uh, reforestation. So that's about it. We are planning to go live on the system uh, this fall. Um, but you don't have to wait. You can go right now. We have a landing page. Um, provide your details, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to engage you once we're ready. Tom, that was pretty much it. Do we have um, Francisco? Okay, thank you, Ron. Yeah, um, I'm still trying to reach Francisco, unfortunately. Um, it, it, his connection died. He was online earlier, so still trying. Um, I don't know if anybody has any, any questions or comments in the meantime. While I try to reach sort of Francisco, I know we have to wrap up in a few minutes. But does anybody want to share a question or a, or a comment? Or at least either Ron or I to respond to? I'll try Francisco again. Let's see if he can speak. That was ringing. It's unfortunate uh, in this day and age, we still have uh, issues with um, <laughs> having these events work out. Uh, and get people connected that really, we really want to hear these frontline voices, such as Francisco, because he's really the driver of this. So, and I'm having trouble reaching him. I don't know, Francisco, estás en línea? I'm having trouble reaching everybody. So I apologize for that. And hopefully his voice uh, manifested itself in the video. And uh, feel free to reach out to either of us, uh, Region or Rainforest uh, Foundation, and, and to see, learn more about the work. And we're both available to move this forward, thinking of a longer term vision. The idea is like, as Ron mentioned, to change the game, that this technology on the ground can link people directly to financing through a platform, as Ron was, uh, was demonstrating, and therefore, for people to see real benefits. And, and, and one thing I didn't mention was these communities are under tremendous pressure from loggers, coca growers, that the poverty is extreme. So the fact that there is, we know that we have to save the rainforest and, and, refor and, 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 and plant trees to mitigate the climate crisis. Meanwhile, uh, the people that have to do it need the support in order for them to be able to carry this out and. And, and, and not have to make tough decisions such as, do I feed my family by say, uh, uh, working with, uh, or, or, you know, deforesting or logging? And that's a very key uh, uh, aspect to consider, even though, of, of course, historically these forests have been conserved. So uh, we hope that um, we can be in contact and we'll share this video and, and uh, 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 Francisco's had a speech or had a presentation ready. I will share that as well when we um, af after the event because I know all this is being recorded. So um, it's unfortunate um, he was ready, but I can't reach him. So I feel bad, but but he'll be there in the final product. So if anybody has any final questions, I know we have to wrap up soon, but we're both around as is Orpio to respond to to any further inquiries. Any further comments, Ron, or, or questions, uh, anybody? Uh, a few in the Q&A, Tom. Q&A feature. Um, yes. A question here on, um, sorry, I apologize if I referred to Indigenous communities at Land Stewards. I was presenting our general platform, and we just use Land Stewards as sort of a, uh, a general term to refer to 
farmers, ranchers, especially when we're talking about agricultural conservationists. Um, and in this case, I was extending that uh, perhaps uh, improperly to indigenous communities, but sort of the other side, the folks actually doing the work on the ground, basically. I'm having a hard time seeing the Q&A on my, on my little phone. I'm sorry, Paul. If, 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 if anybody has a question or, uh, or if you want to bring one up, um, please uh, select. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you all for uh, sharing. Um, this was our, our, our first uh, panel for today. And uh, I, I saw that there were some, some questions in the, the question and panel, and there is one, uh, so, so from Angela Paula Noviello. Uh, she says, in today's program, I read the topic of mobile data and video making as empowering this possibility to share the voice of direct people and true experience in contrast with all fake claiming and news. How can this platform be expanded? She also said, today I attended a free West Papa campaign and Zoom meeting Sadly, 20 people attended, and most of the comments visible on the post were written by fake profiles. Uh, one photo, no friend, not supporting, or either worse, claiming fake information regarding the history and present of West Papa, genocide, and environmental issue. Aman, if not us, then who, guardians of the forest, constantly share the voice of who need to be heard and empowered. How can we go a next step, enlarging the platform reaching out of our peer of interested and truly passionate people, reaching the one not knowing, the one that doesn't search for this information, and the many who are, uh, who are, who have not heard and can't speak. Uh, what I heard much in this day of talk is our realization of oneness and unity. I, I think she's trying to ask here, um, is how can a platform like this be used to uh, amplify the voice of the people in West Papa? So if uh, maybe Tom or uh, Ron, maybe you can talk a little bit about it. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, this activity, I feel like, uh, is applicable, adaptable anywhere. For forest conservation, keep it intact for us, be they in West Papua or in Africa or in Brazil or Peru. And the idea is that people are doing the work and conserving forests and out there keeping their forests intact despite threats, they should be compensated for that. And, and, and Ron, maybe you want to discuss the geographical feature, but the argument here is, or from our perspective as Rainforest Foundation, is that the sky is the limit. And there's all, the, all, you know, all these financing mechanisms, it's very well recognized and indigenous are the guardians of the forest. It's recognized that we have to save the rainforest. Now, the people doing that work, uh, regardless of where they are, uh, we'd be happy from our perspective to, to figure out a system to measure that and then work with, you know, region and Ron and others to, to, you know, to make that happen so that they have some direct financing given the, uh, and I know Papua have been there, the, the poverty is extreme there. Yeah, the I, can add, I can just add okay. a couple of things. Uh, a core part of our platform is providing agency to the different stakeholders. Um, so unlike other solutions that are top down, in this case, the community, the, the actual folks on the ground are going to define and um, actually state exactly what they need uh, and what um, um, evidence they can provide to prospective buyers of, of the work done on the ground. Um, so it's very much driven um, bottom up rather than top down. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ron. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm sure you know we can have more discussions on these. Uh, these are topics which can take us uh, like hours discussing. Um, however, we have a, an agenda here that we'll be trying to follow as close as possible. So we'll be moving on to another panel, another uh, session, <coughs> and uh, this session will be hosted by Leo Serda. Um, it's a panel on smartphone stories for social justice. And uh, we hope that you can, you know, pay attention, uh, listen, and again, you can put your questions into the Q&A. I'd like to encourage the panelists, um, as the discussions are happening, if you can check in the Q&A to see what questions may be directed to you, 
in that way you can you can respond to the questions in your talk so not necessarily waiting until we have a question and answer session but you can already see what people are asking and you can in your in, in your presentation answer them directly so that at the, by the end we will have maybe less questions to answer so that we, you know, we're trying to ensure that we give uh, everyone an opportunity to to have their questions answered so with this I'd like to hand you over to Leo Serda Leo thank you thank you thank you to our village and if not us then who I'm going to be hosting the panel on uh, smart phone stories for social justice. We see that um, now due to media and uh, indigenous resistance across the globe, I think um, a smartphone, the smartphone use and the footage can be of a lot of use for our resistance and to our collective awakening to share our stories from our different platforms and we have access to smartphones in the different communities to record what is happening and the destruction that is happening in the amazon and how are we resisting so i want to welcome i want to welcome our four uh, panelists uh kalfin wusan from the indonesian indigenous youth front and from north sulawesi and um and Irawan Putra from the Indonesian Nature Film Society, and Dreaji Aguilar from Media Ninja in Brazil, and Maya Lili from the Years Project from in the United States of America. Uh, the four panelists will be introducing themselves, and after uh, a short introduction, they there will be a video of one minute about the work that they're doing. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Kelfin Busan from Indonesia. Kelfin, I think you're on mute or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Uh, okay, uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Calvin Wisan. I am from Wuwuk village in North Sulawesi from Indonesia. And now I represent uh, Youth Indigenous Front or BPAN from Aman from Indonesia. Um, maybe I will uh, talk about uh, the smartphone movement that uh, involved by youth engineers in, in Indonesia that uh, want to encourage and inspiring all people to protect their community. Um, documentation using a smartphone in the community has uh, become a, a very important and effective ways in this era. Because uh, nowadays, almost everyone owns a smartphone, especially the youth indigenous. They use a smartphone to document all activities in their indigenous territories. Uh, for example, their daily activities, such as farm work, uh, rituals in community, uh, they visit the cultural site, uh, documenting their elders, their festival, and even any outside interference that threatens their indigenous territories. With smartphone, they make documentation in form of video, short movies, uh, photos, news video, graphic design such as poster, infographics, and also write things about their indigenous territories. And this is exactly what the youth engineers of Indonesia do. Thank you. Thank you, Kalfin. Uh, now we want to show you, uh, the audience uh, the one minute video about the work that you're doing. Di konteks kekinian, 
Generasi hari ini bisa menggunakan seperangkat teknologi seperti smartphone untuk menjaga wilayah adat. Kita bisa menggunakan smartphone untuk mendokumentasikan wilayah adat serta segala sesuatu yang terkait dengannya. Ini sebagai upaya untuk mengklaim bahwa ini wilayah adat kita. Ini juga sebagai usaha untuk menggugah kesadaran banyak orang agar menjaga wilayah adatnya. Karya yang dihasilkan lewat smartphone dapat berupa film pendek, video berita, foto, karya grafis, dan juga tulisan. Kita juga bisa menggunakan smartphone untuk belajar bahasa daerah kita dari orang yang fasi. You on YouTube, Leo? Uh, thank you, Calvin, for your introduction. Now we're going to go ahead for uh, to introduce our next panelist, and that one from the Indonesian Nature and Film Society. And, and are you here with us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, how long I have time for sharing and presentation? <laughs> This is just a short introduction, and then we'll go to questions for uh, uh, you individually after your short introduction. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. My name is Ani Rawan Putra. Uh, all of my friend called just An. So I'm working for uh, Rekam Santara Foundation. We have one unit focus on documentary uh, the name is Indonesian Nature Film Society or INVIS uh, yeah I focus on documentary more than 15 years with Paul and uh, with teams and also when we start for if not us then who thank you uh, now we're gonna go ahead and show the video of your organization Sekarang kita di Purdiang, tempat pengeluaran perusahaan. Jadi ibu-ibu bermalam di sini untuk menjaga alat-alat no, eh, perusahaan di sini supaya jangan ada yang merusak. Jadi selama dua bulan ibu-ibu di sini, siang malam di sini. Jadi setiap ada kepolisian yang datang kunjungi kami, kami segera kumpul-kumpul di sini, Pak. Karena ini tiang yang kita awas, toh. Langsung juga saya bilang, kenapa, Pak? Mau dipaksakan ini, nah kami ibu-ibu di sini, kami bertahan di sini karena memang bertegas untuk bertahan, kami tidak mengizinkan perusahaan masuk di sini, Pak. Langsung itu we, e, gas air mata ditembakkan di hadapan kami semua, ibu-ibu yang banyak di sana. Thank you, Anne, for your introduction. And um, we, we're seeing that is uh, the importance of, uh, of a smart phone uh, use and recording for our fights, for our resistance. I just saw in your video that people were in the front lines of and, and, and documenting what is happening so we can show uh, our peers and the world what is happening, what is like police brutality, how uh, is the government repression in our communities. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Triagi Aguilar from Media Ninja in Brazil. Uh, Triagi, are you here? Welcome. Oi, boa tarde, welcome. Hey, I'm Triagi, I'm Triagi Aguilar, I'm from Brazil. I work at Media Ninja, which is a, a social movement for communication where we Organize in a network all these uh, media activists here in Brazil who are reporting on, on, on policy brutality, on racism, on, on sexism, on LGBT phobia, and all the 
other social issues that Brazil is facing right now and has been facing since our since well since ever and, and in our foundation. So, so that's it. Media Ninja is a, it's a connection between uh, media <coughs> activists, and we do pretty much a lot in our phones. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, We're gonna you. show uh, one kind of teaser of your work um, before we continue with the conversation. Yes. <laughs> Voltamos ao vivo para o último bloco do Roda Ninja. Se não fizer moradia, também não vai ter roupa. Muito orgulho que a gente está aqui ao vivo pela mídia ninja. You are muted, Leo. Uh, thank you, Driaji. Now I'm going to go ahead to introduce. Maya Lili from the Years Project in the United States. Maya, are you here with us? I am here. So welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I moved to Hollywood about 20 years ago to try to uh, illuminate the environmental crisis and climate crises because I felt like the environmental movement was really failing to tell that story, and it's been a wild ride. So my name is Maya Lili. I'm a producer. Um, I've worked on conscious projects like documentaries like The Big Fix about the BP Gulf oil spill, um, Resist, a docu-series about um, people fighting prison economy I've, with Vice. Um, I've worked on a series called Finding Justice, which was Black communities fighting injustices around the country. And I did a documentary called Generation Wealth for Amazon that was looking at how wealth around the world has shifted our moral compass. And all of this to say, I've, I've learned how to tell a good story. And I've also learned that Hollywood is not messing around with the story of earth guardianship. So that leaves us in this really weird place. But the good news is like, we all have these smartphones, right? We all know how to document with the phone that we have everywhere. So my goal for this panel, like truly, is to, to give as much insight into how to tell a good story from what I've learned, because you have to tell a good story for anybody to want to watch it. So the example that you're going to play, the video, is from a young woman who contacted our The Years Project. We have the largest digital following for climate news online. And she wanted us to document a video that she had taken on her smartphone and figure out a way to put it on our platform. And so what we had to do was take the footage and then figure out a way to storytell it so we made it better. And so this is her at the UN climate meeting. My name is Isabel Falahi. I'm at COP25 and I recently tried staging a peaceful protest at a climate panel featuring David Hone, a Shell executive. Our original intent as climate activists was to stand parallel to the exit of the doorway, lock arms and hold our hands up, no singing, no chanting, and then they said that if we do this action that they will revoke our COP25 badges. Meanwhile, COP is allowing major polluters like Shell into these talks. By 2030, they actually want to start speeding up the drilling of oil. This is not a climate solution, this is climate destruction and the ecological breakdown that we are currently here at COP to fight. And what would you like to see happen to them at these talks? I want to see them out of the talks. And by 
by the way, she's only 15 years old. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that uh, video with us. Uh, now, uh, I think we're going to go with a with a with a panel discussion. I have a few questions. Um, I want to encourage any one of you that wants to speak about this issue or the, the question, just jump in. Uh, we have a, I, I, uh, we have selected a few different questions for um, uh, for the panel. So the, the first one is uh, I want to know what is your experience of seeing a smartphone documentation in your community activism? How does it had it has potential to impact the the narrative and the story for your community? Uh, how has this um, uh, documentation has worked to support your activism? Um, I'm gonna go. Anyone wants to jump in? Calfin, uh, uh, Calfin, do you want to say anything? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think uh, when we ask what the potential impact and why it's kind of document and documentation important, I think uh, all people in this world are familiar with smartphone. Many of them find information through it. So, uh, we can use this condition to tell our community stories. We can use smartphone as a tool to documenting our community and also to spread the message. And now, every single person who owns smartphone could documenting their customer land in many forms. Not only photos and video, but also in graphic design and writings. Uh, with smartphone and internet connection, People could easily connect with anyone across the globe. Thus, the documentation produced by using smartphone could be shared. All the works produced through smartphone could be shared in social media and internet in real time. So that many people could get information and aware about the ingenious people existence and activities inside the community. Uh, with smartphone, we could independently produce and share the correct information about our community. We could also control the message that we want to deliver by our documentation works. By working on documentation through smartphone, uh, we could also instantly make a verification and confirmation concerning what is happening in our community. Smartphone uh, documentation could be used as uh, evidence against unilateral claims or acts of everything that occur in indigenous territory. So smartphone could also be used as a tool for resistance. And when it combined with internet connection, it will be even more powerful. All documentation produced by a smartphone could be used as a manifesto and claims for the existence of indigenous community. And also, it could be one way to refute the negative stigma who assumes that indigenous people are backward and technological illiterate. The works produced through Thanks. smartphone is also made to educate, to inspire, and to raise people awareness about the indigenous people, nature, and the life in it. Okay. Thank you. And I, I wanna to ask you, why this kind of the documentation is important, especially for communities of color and indigenous people at the forefront of the fight against climate change, since we're the first, uh, we are also the first ones to suffer the consequences of COVID-19. Uh, would you share more about like, uh, how, like how is your community being impacted? How, uh, uh, why is this kind of work important and this type of documentation? And are you here still? Uh, and, thank you. Yes. Uh, Leo. Yeah, based on my experience, I have many times uh, traveled or went to Indian people's community and visit their lands and their forests. That's why uh, totally make me agree 
uh, the Indian people can manage their area or their lands. Uh, <clears throat> and that's also why I have to make decision to focus on uh, on documentary after that trip uh, because many of voices uh, from grassroots uh, yeah, is about their local wisdom or about their uh, their rights or maybe also inspirations uh, did not reach to the public or also to the, or the governments or policy maker. So that's why it's important the, <clears throat> this uh, documentary. And and also based on my experience, when uh, we make one of documentary, film documentary, uh, <clears throat> recording, especially if the video is about conflict, because if not us, then who many times we uh, making a video for if not then who project is about conflict. So uh, the story about conflict, uh, the footage from the smartphone is really helpful because they record, they have a, uh, they recording uh, at the moment intimidation or uh, uh, from the military or the police or from the company. So they have uh, the proof or they have a fact what happened on that time uh, because we visit that place uh, this already happened. So that's why easy, easy for us for making the story. We just interview and then following uh, the characters. So from Thank that you. footage from my phone is very strong. And then Thank you. Um, one more uh, I need to share to the Indian peoples or the, the youth. Uh, we must know the documentary is just not only understand how the technical aspect or using the smartphone or maybe even the, the good camera. But we need also understand the issue, uh, be able to convey the, the fact. And, and also this is, we will make the bridge for the solution or it is, will make a change uh, in that area. So yeah, that is uh, our experience on, in, 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 in Indonesia. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk to Triaji about the role activist media has played in inserting activist content in entertainment spaces. What you can tell us about this? So um, this is a very big thing because we are actually, one of the things about using it on cell phones about is actually where you're gonna use it, right? You're probably gonna use it not only to uh, make a photo or take a photo, or make a video, but you're actually live streaming on social media, putting the photos and videos on social media. So you're actually occupying spaces that are not made for that. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they are not made for activism. They are made to share day-to-day -day life stories. They're made to, I don't know, like to check on your ex-boyfriend. They're made to, set, to put a photo of her ice cream. That's why they exist. So what's happening when uh, here in Brazil for 2013, when like the big, big protests happened and uh, the bubble burst. So now we as citizens are not only interested on sharing ice cream pictures, no longer, not anymore. Uh, we are actually trying to tell stories about where we're going to, which means protests. So it's, it's actually, um, it has been a very, um, a very, interesting experience to actually go and take journalism, which is what we in Indonesia do. We do, we take stories and, and, and spread them and, and tell the stories on the, on the side of the people that are not being actually told on, on the history books. So you probably, if you're going to make a round table in my country to talk about journalists, someone like me would never be there. You will not be talking to a woman of color, you'll not be talking to LGBT, you'll not be talking to a woman actually. So we probably want, want to talk to a old white cis hetero male so, and, and, and ask him what's the story about my country. And that, that, that person, even though they live here, they're actually not the face of our history. So um, what we did in 2010 is that we took uh, the decision of if we're gonna do journalism, we're gonna do it where people are. 
So we look at social media and see that this is the square, like this is the shopping mall, this is the park, this is the streets, this is where people are. So this is gonna where we're gonna occupy and put journalism there. And 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 like that, uh, we we started among other other journalism uh, websites and other networks that uh, pretty much were born or, or they grew up during the same time we did. We started occupying these spaces that was made for entertainment and put politics in there. So now we're gonna you go to Facebook and then you were expecting to see, I don't know, a cat video. And then from the Sunday, you're gonna see a police brutality video. And that shocks you because that's not where it's supposed to be. That belongs to the news. And when that starts to invade in your life, actually gave people more, not only uh, the idea that, hey, this is not a virtual space, it's actually somewhere that's connected to my life. And it starts slowly to break down that idea that there's a, online and offline life, which much people pretty much try to convey that what you do online has nothing to do with your offline uh, life. But I guess now with the quarantine, you actually see that we are all virtual people too, as much as we are offline people. So we have to connect all, all of those things. But aside Thank of you. that, we actually, I'm sorry, I'm gonna end up real quick. But aside of that, we are uh, actually, not only uh, trying to convince people that politics belong in their lives, but we are also telling them that politics can be, can be made on a storytelling and a pop vibe. So we are not only talking about politics on the harsh way, old school, red marks and stuff. We actually, on Media Ninja, we try to make a meme to explain everything that's happening in our politics. We try to make a 15 second video to show what's happening with women. We're trying to make like a tweet about what's a police brutality. So we are trying to uh, make people understand that politics ha doesn't have to be this hard language, this, uh, this language that only people that has interest in politics and are initiated and know what a, politi a, policy, uh, a politics party means or what's left wing, what's right wing. This is all the language they built in order to push us away from economics, politics, and all the macro teams that they keep pushing on us and telling, hey, this is not supposed, you're not supposed to be talking about this. You are citizens and citizens do not care about economics, do not care about health, do not care about education, do not care about politics. So we actually, because of that, because we are pushing political subject into a pop, into a, a, a entertainment space, we actually shifting the way that politics has been talking about in this country. So this is H, I guess, uh, I guess okay. uh, putting information on a space that's not supposed to be actually shifting and changing the face of politics in my country. Yeah, we have to grab back our spaces and our spaces of power, like we have to utilize the different tools that are given to us because our stories generally have not been heard, you know, and the protests like uh, government repression and the mass media do not show government repression. I saw your video and you were on the front lines collecting the data saying like, this is the repression that we're seeing at the front lines and we're fighting for the social security or we're fighting for the welfare of the people of the whole country and indigenous people are fighting at the forefront for the protection of the planet, of the force of the planet. Um, Maya, I wanted to talk to you uh, about like what's uh, your vision behind collecting a smartphone footage? You know, we, we uh, to, to uh, uh, then it be utilized in, in the different spaces. Now, now you say you work in Hollywood. We're we're seeing a lot of uh, artists supporting the causes of indigenous people or the Black Lives uh, Matter movement across the planet. But how can uh, what is our vision as activists and 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 as people from the south to to coll mutually collaborate in solidarity, but not being overshadowed by the platforms that these people have in their entertainment business? Um, well, I think there are three ways that indigenous footage gets used, at least in the United States, but also other places. One is for the news. So when there is a topical story, news will reach out and be like, hey, I need someone on the ground who has this footage or who caught this event can I use it, right? Two is, you know, filmmakers, documentarians will look for indigenous footage because we don't have access to the B-roll. 
For example, so the YEARS project will use stock footage from Pond5, Getty, like some of these picture houses if we don't have the footage internally. Most of them have no indigenous footage at all. So we have a complete lack visually of how to tell the story. So what I do is I reach out to activists on the ground, like Helena Goalinga, you know, and say, hey, do you have any footage of this? And so it's so important for people to be documenting, documenting so that the people that are trying to do the projects can call upon the footage and grab it from community. And then the third is that we have this whole new social media landscape that has completely revolutionized Hollywood. So like Apple, for example, is now has a, a, you know, a whole TV program, you know, everybody is getting into it because social media changed cable. And so we have this opportunity for indigenous communities to be telling their own stories on social media, often to more views than a TV show has. Right. So like we at the years project, we just got like a billion views in January. That's pro that's most likely more views than we got for our TV show that won the Emmy. You know what I mean? So it's like so. So key, I think, Leo, is like we have to become masters of the craft of storytelling. And there are countless books like this one I really wanted to share. This is one of the best books about how to make your story stick in an audience's mind and just how to craft because we have to be good at that. Otherwise, like, you know, nobody's gonna watch something. Everybody wants to watch Tiger King, you know, nobody wants to watch the news comparatively. So like, how can we like create stories that are interesting like Tiger King and better and then do, use it for social media and hack the system? Yeah, I think that is very important. I think one last question that I wanted to ask uh, the panelists is, what 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 is our ask to our viewers to the people who who are watching this this stream like how can people support independent media making for the people in the grassroots you know for the people in the communities what is a what what would you suggest to the people watching this and how can they support directly the grassroots organizations i'm going to start with uh, Kalfein. Yeah, okay. Um, if you ask about this, this topic, about the, the best practice and top tips to the uh, ground uh, communities, uh, I think uh, a smartphone could easily be, be a chosen, uh, documentation tools because it's uh, affordable. We could use also uh, we could also do many things with single tools, smartphone. Uh, not only as a communication device, we could also smartphone to make documentation of our community content. Uh, here are uh, some best uh, practice and topics that we are used in Indonesia. Uh, first, we could use smartphone to take photos, or movies with a short duration, and the photos and the movie could tell us about a person a nature or a cultural richness. Uh, a second, we could use smartphone to make news video about uh, what is happening in our community. We could upload the news video in our social media and YouTube. Uh, with the news video, we could also make our online TV channel. We could get our own engineers TV that provide truth information about the community to the world. Uh, third, we could also make a graphic design, such a player, a poster, infographics, through smartphone. Uh, this graphic could easily be shared and it could easily reach many people instantly with, with uh, medicine shell. And fourth, smartphone, could also be used to write many things. We could write offline using the notes application, or we can write online. And we could share it real time in our social media. For example, if I have 5,000 friends in Facebook, 5,000 people will reach the message. Uh, remember, 
that the smartphone is basically a communication device. So we could use it to communicate directly to others about our documents, about uh, indigenous territories. So uh, I think to optimize the practice of smartphone documentation, we could initiate some training or workshop on how to do smartphone documentation. I hope uh, we can inspire many people by our works using smartphone. That's Thank all. Uh, and uh, would you like to say some words about a smartphone doc documentation and what the, uh, our audience can do to support uh, communities in the ground doing the work that you're doing, that the panelists are doing? I am very, very honored to be here. And would you like to say some words? Yeah, uh, first I want to answer the Maya, uh, respond the Maya statement. If you come to Indonesia, don't worry about the footage, Indonesian footage, because we have a lot of Indonesian footage. You know, we very serious to archive all uh, footage, more than 300 terabyte data. This is 4G, uh, 4K. Uh, format and uh, we made the database so just uh, keyword the, the place or the English peoples you can find it in our server nice. <clears throat> so that's why uh, we we are very serious about this uh, footage maybe now it's not really not a big value of this year but we will see 15 years or 100 years soon how this change all of Indonesia territory or all of Indonesia land or maybe about the Indian people's uh, group. They are still there or not, or <laughs> they still have a land or not because we have a footage before. So we can compare uh, 10 years or uh, yeah, uh, our next generation to see what happened a long time ago about the indigenous peoples uh, in, in Indonesia. And then uh, <clears throat> why the documentary or some documentation is really important. I will show you my experience when we made, when I made the video of Seko, the, the first uh, Leo played that video. So I will share uh, one's photos to you. Wait. Uh, this one. You know, 2008, I take picture of this guy, this one. And then 2017, I come back. And when I introduce myself, and he said, so you are named Annie Rowan Putra? Yes, who are you? And then she saw the photos. You take these photos? Yes, it's, that's my photos. So finally, I can meet you. <laughs> so he is still on the elementary school on that time. So when I went come back to documenting about the conflict on that area and come back to their place, he remember me because uh, on that time I scanned the slide because uh, on 2006 it still used the negative or positive. So I scanned that all of the archive and then I give to the local NGO on that area. So maybe he shared to the, co the community. This moment is really helped me when I want to uh, interview all of victim uh, their a parent in the jail so uh, he introduced to her parent and then uh, to his parent and then he said and he's uh, ready to go visit our village on that time so i believe here i believe him and then i trust him to want, want to help uh, our our peoples that is really for me this a uh, yeah that's why it's really important what is a documentary, what is a document about the Indian peoples, about their territory. And then uh, for the strategy, 
how to disseminate this video. Three years ago, I set up the communication units. So because this is important to make a strategy, what, how we can encourage our video. You know, making documentary is not easy. We, can, we need to stay on the village. We need to visit the forest one week, two weeks. But we need competition with, uh, with uh, yeah, I, I said the trash, uh, trash media, I said, <laughs> because no, no important at all that's uh, in mainstream uh, television. So that's why I, when we have the comm unit, we can create the strategy, maybe making a short video, the trailer, and using the, all the social media. So now uh, slowly uh, the viewers on our account is more increased. Uh, more than 100,000 people view. So, and then, yeah, this is really, we have really concern with this uh, strategy. So that's why uh, we need to think about the dissemination strategy. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you. you. I think uh, we're going to wrap up. Um, I want to have some time to let um, Maya and Riaji speak on the, on the final words about a smartphone documentation and what the audience can do. Um, the, um, uh, Riaji? I, I just want to highlight that people shouldn't shouldn't be afraid of the format. So like what they can do with a, with a photo or a video is actually infinite efficient. So they should not be afraid to make an interview or live streaming or add some color or put a different clothes or I don't know tie your hair differently. So they should, if you want to to call for attention in the middle of the, the ocean that is social media, you should be thinking a little bit more about how you put your your content in the world. That, uh, that means lighting, that means sound, that mean, but also means putting yourself on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the landscape of being an interesting person in order to convey and bring up the story that you want. Uh, and to wrap it up, I wanna just uh, tell everyone that you guys hope as much as you can when you share the content. That doesn't, please don't forget that this is the most important thing for us. We want, if you wanna do as Kelfin, uh, Kelfin was talking about, like if you have 5,000, followers and in order to get the content there these 5,000 people has to share the content at least um, just a call out to everyone that if you are to, if you want to engage and you want to be part of it all you have to do is click is click the share button that's it thank you Maya nice Triadji I think you're so cool I just want to say that <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I try to bring what I learned in Hollywood to uh, journalism and to climate and to the environmental movement. And the thing that always ends up in the cut in, in the video um, is urgency, high stakes, um, often still a hero or a Hera's journey. Um, yes, there's room for beauty and joy and community and we have to show that, but I, I think it's really important to still wrap it up like Driaji does into something interesting. So trying to find a way to tell the story that is through the lens of like rising conflict, high stakes, like what is it, what is at risk for the main character? Like what, how can you shape your narrative so that you actually are using the years since Greek theater and all the years since Odysseus and everything that we've learned from storytelling in that microcosm of a moment. So what ends up on the cutting room floor in my field is tangents, theories, and this is something that a lot of climate activists do. They'll just launch into what they think about something. No, we wanna know who, what, where, when, why. Why is it important? Start in the middle of the action. Don't start with like, my name is, I've been here forever. This is what I think about this. Start with like, I'm at the UN climate meeting. I just got kicked out by the UN and now I'm gonna start a ruckus <laughs> because we wanna watch that video. We don't wanna watch you talking a tangent or a theory about like what you're doing. So, um, so like just learning how to cultivate story, learning how to really interview people on the ground. And then last thing I'll say is the thing we never get that we always need is what we call a reverse shot. So like everybody wants to film Greta, right? 
They're all, all cameras are on Greta. What we want to know as the audience is how is the audience reacting? How is the audience reacting to Greta? So we want to see Greta and then we want to see the reverse shot of the audience sobbing because Greta just killed it. You know what I mean? So always catch the front shot and the reverse shot any as much as humanly possible. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I am very, I'm very honored to be here with all of you. I think the work that each individual uh, uh, of you and your organizations do for, for the planet and for the resistance and for your communities, is, it's amazing. Um, I just want to say thank you to, if not us, then who? And uh, our village for having us and for giving us this space to, to have voices from the south and from around the world to speak um, on, on these issues uh, as more documentation let's keep doing uh, let's keep using our voices let's, let's keep using the different platforms that we have at our disposal to enhance our work and to let the people know what we're doing and and to have us in control and, uh, and in power of our narratives and the stories that we want to tell the world thank you and i'm gonna go uh, we're gonna go next with the next panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leo and the panel for sharing those very exciting stories. Um, I know storytelling is one of those things which, well, as indigenous peoples, you know, we have our stories, but how do we tell them? And I think. Uh, the last panel was just sharing, you know, some some ways in which it can be done. I believe that, you know, now that we have a certain technology available to us in our hands that we can actually shoot and produce videos using the, the handheld devices that we have. Um, so I think it's one of the things that, you know, as indigenous peoples, we can explore some more um, in terms of how do we tell our stories, because many times our stories have been told for us you know it is time that we start telling our own stories and uh, i think the last panel really uh, shared that and it really brought that together in terms of how we can do it and what we can do so remember this is our village and our village is organized by the if not us then who and hip-hop caucus as well as the guardians of the forest so we thank you for for joining us. Um, we still have more panels. We have more discussions which will happen uh, throughout the day. Um, so we hope that you can continue to, continue to be with us. And you know, maybe later you hear me play a song uh, for you, uh, but we're working with an agenda. So our next panel is titled uh, Cinematic Communities. It's about uh, decolonizing the big screen and it's hosted by Hollywood actor Bill Pullman, who is also a member of the, the board, if not us, then who? So remember this, this village is about connecting people. It's about networking, um, all about a solutions focus. So yes, we discuss issues, but we also want to discuss solutions as well. So I'll hand you over to Bill Pullman, who is the host of the next sessions. Bill. Hi, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm very glad to be here and uh, thank you all for tuning in to this part of uh, I think I'm being heard, right? Yes, you are heard. I think you okay, want, great. I think but, you want uh, to we're, turn your interpretation off, just be up. Turn what? Your interpretation off. Okay. Uh, at least the, the, the audio. Ah, okay. There. Is this better? Can you hear me now? Much better, thanks. Okay, great. Well, I'll start again. This is always good to get a second shot at it, but we're welcome to everybody who's here for the cinematic communities, decolonizing the big screen. And um, I'm glad that we are joined today by three indigenous filmmakers who are very active in telling stories that reflect their communities and our times. And, uh, my name is Bill Pullman and I'm on the board, as Michael said, of uh, If Not Us Then Who, which has been a great privilege. And, uh, um, you know, I'm the old white guy that uh, gets to tag along in this great journey and listen to so many great perspectives about um, the struggle that uh, is faced by indigenous territories and people. And um, 
I'm honored to be hosting this discussion uh, with filmmakers and our talk, I think we're focusing kind of on some of the things that uh, in the previous uh, workshop were very useful things said by Maya and Rajay and Delphine and Ian and about how to tell the story effectively and, how, and compellingly. So <sighs> we have uh, three filmmakers and I wanted to say maybe if we can first just say hello to each of them so that they're we can uh, recognize who's here today, but uh, I want to say welcome to Yanda Mantajueno from Ecuador and the founder of Tana, the cinema from the territory. Hello, Yanda. Thank you for coming. Great. And Keenan Tega, who is a young Dayak filmmaker from Indonesia, who is achieving quite a lot at this uh, surprising age of 15. Keenan, are you uh, on board? Uh, I think he's hearing and listening, but, uh, and then finally we'll have uh, Priscilla Tapajawara, who is a co-coordinator of the Media India and a rising filmmaker from Brazil. Hello, Priscilla. So we have uh, about 30 minutes to talk about some of these things. And uh, I wanted to start first with Yanda. Uh, I got to tell you that I really enjoyed very much the trailer that uh, we're going to be showing later. But first, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, I think you have some slides to share to set up some of your work. Yanda <laughs> Tuaro, Hola, soy Yanda Tuaro, soy de la nación Zapara del Ecuador, soy de un pueblo que sueña, soy de la selva. Mi, el sueño, la visión que yo tuve me ha traído a este mundo tecnológico mágico que es el cine. Ese mundo especial. Voy a compartir un poco sobre mi, mi, mis actividades, mi trabajo, el sueño Tauna. Tauna. Está. En los sueños, en los sueños de nosotros, los Zaparas, hemos visto situaciones que vivimos en el mundo y lo que estamos viviendo actualmente aquí en la tierra. Nuestros abuelos, nosotros, yo vengo, como decía, de este mundo mágico donde nos relacionamos mediante las, mediante las plantas, viajamos para conocer nuestro camino. Yo cuando era muy pequeño no conocía eh, la cámara, no sabía que era una cámara, pero en los sueños, los espíritus, los abuelos, un árbol, un, un animal, el agua, me mostraban una, un aparato. Y en ese aparato yo podía mirar situaciones, cosas, imágenes. Yo siempre caminaba pensando, ¿qué es este sueño? Un día a un tío que es líder espiritual, que es, que es Manari, le conté este sueño. Él me dijo, Tú tienes un camino que contar al mundo. Este mundo mágico que venimos, debemos, debes captar esas imágenes ahora en la tecnología. Entonces, mi sueño me guió a este camino, a este mundo mágico, donde vamos a contar. Estamos soñando el nuevo cine desde nosotros, desde la selva, desde cómo mira un pájaro, desde cómo mira la anaconda, el agua, la luna, la mañana, cómo mira este mundo mágico a través del video, del cine. Esto es nuestro sueño, ahora estamos construyendo, haciendo este cine desde nosotros, desde el sentir, desde el corazón. Es, una, es el cine para ayudar a proteger la Amazonía, la selva, la naturaleza los derechos de nosotros, de los pueblos indígenas. Porque nosotros hemos vivido muchos años, muchísimos años, 
en situaciones críticas. Muy, hace mucho tiempo mi pueblo era más de 20 mil záparas aquí en el Ecuador, entre Perú, pero en la actualidad somos apenas 500 personas, somos 500 záparas y hay tres abuelas mías que hablan mi idioma porque hubo mucha conquista, mataron mucho a mi, a mi comunidad. Hasta hoy en día han venido de nuevas formas a matarnos a nosotros con temas de explotar el petróleo, la minería, a sacar también el tema de la tecnología. Vemos que el, ha habido muchos cinematógrafos, camarógrafos que han llegado a, nuestros, a nuestra selva, han tomado una foto, video y se han llevado, pero nunca he visto... nosotros las propias películas. Nosotros queremos mostrar right. estas películas al mundo, que no es necesario destruir a la naturaleza. Mm -hmm. La naturaleza no nos permite que nos va a ayudar. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Yanda. I, uh, I think um, I wanted to uh, get a chance to watch your trailer now with Back to the Forest. And um, in your film, sí, sí, it's... Tuve problema con el audio. Eh, tuve problema un poco con el audio. Me pueden repetir. Okay, yeah, I, I so appreciate this uh, background of your work and, uh, and your people in Ecuador. And I want to show the trailer for Back to the Forest. And this film, I think, is a very brave story about sexual diversity within a community that has just begun to open up and allow some to be heard that haven't been able to identify their sexuality to their people. And uh, I wonder if we can watch that trailer now. Sí, en este momento lo podemos... Eh... Para luchar nuestra identidad de género, es importante romper la cadena y enfrentar el miedo más que un derecho, es un deber. Para mí primero la lucha es ambiental, ¿no? Mi lucha personal es la sexual, pero yo mi lucha la vivo diaria. Yo mi lucha la vivo estando en los espacios en los que estoy, hablando en los espacios, en los que estoy, siendo la misma persona gay en todos estos espacios. Hay que ir debatiendo, hay que ir reflexionando, hay que ir conversando, dialogando, como te digo. Eh, va a haber resistencias, obviamente, también, ¿no? Bastante, pero creo que es necesario hacerlo, ¿no? De que en algún momento también eh, se contemple estas diversidades también dentro del movimiento indígena como un actor importante que puede catalizar, que puede empujar, que puede dinamizar el mismo movimiento indígena.
Thank you very much for that. I, uh, I find uh, that there's some very compelling moments in this uh, piece. And one of my favorites is, I think his name is Leo, who uh, stands in front of the tree yeah. silently. And, uh, you know, it begins with that great shot of, uh, from far up above. And then it goes to him, just him, no talking in front of the tree and turning around. And there's something compelling about that moment. And I wondered what inspired you to, to put that moment in the trailer. Muchas gracias. Y sí, este es un corto, eh, una película que vamos a trabajar. Este es un trailer y en, actualmente estamos en, buscando eh, un apoyo para poder hacer este, esta película aquí en la Amazonía. Son varios actores, queremos hacer, eh, contar esta historia contar desde, el, desde nosotros, como decía, esto es el nuevo, eh, el, las nuevas ideas y formas de contar el cine amazónico ecuatoriano desde el sueño, desde, que, desde el respeto. Esta película también va a ayudar mucho a visibilizar en la Amazonía ecuatoriana la, la, de la, la comunidad LGBTI amazónica, que es una lucha con a diario una lucha constante que nuestros pueblos mismos no conocen estas luchas y entonces para vernos nosotros hay que hacer esta película para poder fortalecernos como hermanos como la naturaleza necesita apoyo necesitamos hacer este este documental película que se está planificando actualmente y Yo estoy muy contento que te guste nuestro trabajo. Estoy feliz de eh, compartir este, este sueño con ustedes al mundo. Eh, sin nosotros, sin juntarnos todos, no podemos construir un mundo equilibrado. Vamos a estar muy dispersos. Es momento y es tiempo de apoyarnos para construir los nuevos las nue los nuevos lenguajes cinematográficos y ayudarnos nosotros sí necesitamos ayuda acá en en todos los rincones del mundo estamos esa minga ese trabajo colectivo para crear estos este este cine desde el corazón desde el chungu desde el corazón para nuestras luchas para nuestras nuestra existencia También yo siento, pienso, si nosotros no lo hacemos, ¿quién lo va a hacer? No hay más. Nosotros debemos hacer. Huitzaja, muchas gracias. Very good point. Yeah, this, uh, the challenge of telling the story, I would imagine you'll need to encourage subjects who will tell their own stories. Maybe some of them are, have uh, already come out and others who are just beginning to have the idea to acknowledge their sexual diversity. Has that been a, a difficulty to get people to sometimes tell their stories if they feel their community might have resentment for them or hatred. Sí, no, no escuché la última parte, me podrían ayudar? Yeah, I just am uh, curious about uh, your challenge to get some of the gay community on other communities of diverse sexual diversity to tell their stories when they have fear uh, of resentment from uh, their own people uh, and exposure to hatred uh, that sometimes uh, they have to face when they express themselves. 
Bueno, ahorita actualmente eh, en nosotros hay una nueva generación que ya es más consciente. Somos más, trabajamos, el, este trabajo es colectivo. El, la colectividad nos permite mover muchas cosas, ser más fuertes, sólidos en estos procesos. Y es la primera vez que tocamos el tema de, la, de, de GLBTI en la Amazonía. Eh, como decía, todo esto es ba a base de medicina. La medicina, nosotros le llamamos yauna, tabaco, inhalamos, soñamos y en los sueños nos ayuda a mirar qué vamos a hacer con nuestra vida, qué vamos, cómo vamos a ca caminar mañana, pasado mañana, otra semana, qué va a suceder. Entonces, en este sueño, las visiones nos muestran los caminos. ¿Qué es, lo, ¿Qué es lo que debemos hacer? Este trabajo es un poco duro, eh, porque como decía, es nuevo, eh, va a haber mucha reacción, estamos recién trabajando, eh, pero nosotros estamos seguros que las nuevas generaciones en las comunidades que no ha llegado todavía esta mala información, van a tomarlo muy bien, van a, este, vamos a ayudarles a ellos ah. a, a ser de una forma distinta, porque a nosotros también, a los pueblos amazónicos, nos han, pues, nos han enviado mucha mala información, desinformando, ese odio, ese, ese, ese desconocimiento. Por eso estamos nosotros aquí, porque queremos descolonizar, queremos contar nosotros lo que sentimos y por eso esta película también no tenemos miedo en hacer, estamos muy felices para los pueblos indígenas, en, en, para nosotros no existe el miedo, no hay el miedo, solo son formas no bien contadas que nos vinieron a educar a nosotros. Entonces, eso nos pusieron miedo, pero cuando tomamos medicina dijeron, no existe el miedo, hay que hacer para ayudarnos, para crecer juntos, como la naturaleza cuida a todo. Siempre digo que la naturaleza jamás mata a nadie, no mata, ayuda a crecer, juntos crecen. Las plantas más chiquitas, las hormigas, todo está creciendo. Pero nosotros, los seres humanos, somos un poco muy depredadores. Y frente a eso queremos cambiar nosotros con el cine. Esta película de GLBTI nos va a ayudar mucho a cambiar bastante en nuestras formas de sentir y pensar contra nuestros hermanos, hermanas. Estamos trabajando muy duro. Very good. Thank, thank you for that, Yanda. Um, then moving into the next filmmaker, and Yanda, we will come back and ask some more questions, but uh, now we'll go to the second filmmaker, who is Keenan Tegger. And uh, hello, Keenan, are you there? Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, I think uh, Keenan is close by, maybe. We can hear you, Keenan. You can hear me and I, you're seeing him? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I know you're the youngest of our group today and I'm curious to hear a little bit about how you discovered your interest in filmmaking and, uh, and then we'll get to watch the trailer that you eventually will see the trailer of the La Deng food mm. security issue, the Iban people and use of fire your cultural practices. But Tina, can you give us a little bit of uh, how you came into this work as uh, of filmmaking? Yeah, so good morning to everyone. Well, it's night here, but <laughs> um, I've been making films, I think, ever since I started being homeschooled, which was around two or three years ago. And I first started because it was my first time getting a camera from my, from my dad. 
uh, he gave me a camera from his organization and asked me to help document a ritual that was happening. And so with the limited gear that I had at the time, I made a my first film. And actually, it took quite a while because uh, at the time, I didn't have like a good computer that can edit it and lots of those kind of problems. But one, one day, a friend, a friend of ours asked, asked me if I had anything to show because he, he was running a film festival, a film festival and wanted to show my film if that's a possibility. And so I, I said, yes, yes, I have a film, even though it's barely been edited at all. And there's only a month left, but I just did it. And after that, it was the first time it was shown to other people. I felt really, well, nervous, first of all. And I guess second is proud because what the film means is to share our story to other people, to communicate to communicate what we have to say to other people. And the films that I make are about the cultural practices and the cultural values of our people, the Daya Iban people of Sungai Utik in Kalimantan Island, Borneo Island. And I guess I was also influenced a lot by the people that have come to our village, like the guys from If Not Us Then Who, and, and, and Nanang from Rekam Nusantara, from Indonesia Nature Film Society. They've been coming to our village, Sungai Utik, for a couple of years since then. And I, when I was accompanying them and helping out, I was really interested in what they were doing. They were carrying around these big cameras taking pictures, making videos. And I guess that's what triggered my passion, you could say, and made me want to make film because I thought uh, there were a lot of people from outside, from even other countries coming to our village to, to take videos of us, to document us and to tell our story. And I think that it would be better to tell our story from our own perspective. And yeah, I think that's why. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, I think it's a story that will be encouraging to others uh, around the world who want to tell their own stories from their own perspective. Um, I think it would be great to get to see the trailer right now to, and then we'll get a chance to talk about it. Kita bumi itu udah ratusan tahun lah dari nenek moyang sampai nenek kelia moyang. Kita ke bumi itu belajar tentu area keinek kita coba dari keturunan. Bumi itu berarti kita itu ke hidup, ke hidup. Abang kami si enggak kadi bumi itu. Kami sekeluarga kan pas-pas dia udah nyampe ke nasi baru, hmm. belum belum beli beras gitu. Ya. Di pada kita cukup kan tak perlu kita minta bantuan dari orang bukan. Tutup bas kita, bas. Ada tebas untuk tanam kita, itu nunggu kita tanam kita. Nak nak sebarang nunggu ya, makar nunggu kan sebar. Ia kita makar ada yang ni, padi kita ingat itu mau me, ada yang kita nak bagua me padi itu mau dia kita nak bakar dulu. Nak mungkin kita belajar yang tu nak arus nak membakar dulu. Fantastic.
fantastic uh, imagery and candid uh, sense of uh, who these people are that we're talking to. I'm curious, you know, when I watch this film, I'm struck by your techniques. Uh, the story is great and the, your connection to the issue. And I see that you sometimes lock the camera down in a tripod or something, and mm. other times it's free floating. How do you go about making those decisions? Is it in the moment or are you pre-planning all of that? Uh, most of my films are, I don't know how you would say it, like they're documentaries for sure, because none of it is scripted. If it, even if it's sort of scripted, it would just be for the interviews. And usually I just go around the village shooting their daily activities while asking them questions and writing down what, they, what they're saying and putting that into the film because that's what's important to me and it's it usually just um, a spur of the moment is how I decide so it's not really deciding I guess and yeah, yeah I think that's it it's a great sense of um we get to see, I know for me, the Dayak people and the Iban people, you know, have so such a diverse kind of sense of uh, how the comfortable they are in front of the camera. And uh, but you, I think, get them, give them permission to be very natural inside that. Does that take a long time or did you learn, did you always kind of have that ability? Uh, I think it's less my ability, more of the people of the village, because as I said before, for many years they've been, I guess, recognized as true indigenous people who still practice their culture values. And because of that, uh, people come to document their culture, to interview them, to ask them questions about it. And they've just become used to it over time. Uh, but also my approach when filming is definitely to be candid, to be unnoticed, almost sneaking around them, like secretly taking footage, but, <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah, that's it. I think sometimes you, you know, for subjects that are used to talking about themselves, sometimes you have to disrupt that to find some little candid moments and things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that uh, I love the way that uh, they, they, their faces are so illuminated when they're telling their stories. Mm -hmm. And I, we have some more questions for you, but I think we'll um, uh, come back and uh, have some questions, but let's for, go ahead and uh, meet the third filmmaker as part of this series. Uh, Priscilla Tapajawa from Brazil, whose work reflects the Tapajos community. Uh, Priscilla, hello and welcome. And uh, I know you're working in uh, media activism and making films. And I hope that you can tell us a little bit about how you came uh, into this direction of telling stories uh, within the Amazonian film movement. Hola. É, boa tarde, aqui no Brasil é boa tarde ainda. É, todo mundo está me ouvindo? I can hear you, yeah. Ah, ok. É, então, aqui onde eu moro é na Amazônia Brasileira, no estado do Pará. E é uma região de, onde tem muito conflito com madeireiros, com sujeiros, com os invasores de terras, com os garimpeiros, enfim. E desde mais nova, eu gostava de mostrar as belezas naturais também da minha região, porque aqui onde eu, tenho, onde eu vivo é muito rico. Tem um rio muito bonito, tem umas praias muito bonitas, tem a floresta muito grande. E como eu cresci tendo uma relação muito forte com essa natureza, com o rio, né? eu gostava de mostrar nas minhas fotografias é, isso para as pessoas. Então, eu fui aprimorando mais os meus conhecimentos na área de fotografia 
E eu queria expandir, eu queria conhecer mais nesse, nesse ramo que fosse mais para a questão do audiovisual do cinema. E também porque aqui na minha região, é, por causa desses conflitos e também pela beleza natural, vem muita gente de fora. E essas pessoas, muitas das vezes, contavam nossas histórias com o seu olhar, com a forma delas falarem. E muitas das vezes não era como a gente gostaria que fosse, sabe? Não, não era exatamente do jeito que a gente gostaria que eles estivessem falando. Então, foi um dos motivos que fizeram com que eu estudasse. Eu saí da minha região, eu fui para uma cidade grande, numa capital, sozinha. Eu queria estudar, eu, é, eu queria ter essa oportunidade de, de entrar assim, numa universidade, descolonizar também, né, de poder entrar numa universidade, de adentrar no mercado do audiovisual. E foi aonde que eu comecei a estudar e, e aí foi que eu comecei a, a participar do, do, do mercado do audiovisual. É, e aí aqui na minha região eu faço alguns filmes, eu faço é, trabalho com mídia índia, que é um trabalho também bem voltado com a questão do celular e, e produções é, de conteúdo voltado para as redes sociais. E uma coisa que eu falo muito é que eu descolonizo telas. Eu descolonizo telas nas plataformas digitais, tanto como no do cinema. Então, eu acho que isso é muito importante, porque eu busco referências, de, principalmente de mulheres indígenas, que estão dentro do cinema para me inspirar, como também hoje eu sou referência para a juventude, principalmente para as mulheres da minha região como uma, uma jovem que saiu, que foi buscar um conhecimento fora, né? que foi buscar esse conhecimento da tecnologia para fazer esse agregamento com o conhecimento ancestral que nós temos. E isso que é o diferencial do nosso cinema. É, por mais que um não indígena ele esteja bem intencionado, ele nunca vai mostrar, ele nunca vai fazer um filme como nós indígenas conseguiremos fazer. Very good. Um, I, I'm just learning this format and I uh, checked on the Q&A and people are really responding to what you're saying. And um, when you get a chance to look back, there's some uh, questions and things that people will direct uh, to you that you could read later and uh, address. But um, I think uh, maybe now we can, I'd love to, have us all watch uh, your film and uh, I think the Enchanted Spirits of the Tapajos is a really unusual uh, challenging uh, way that you found to talk about um, some ethereal things and uh, maybe we can discuss that a little bit after the trailer is shown. nossos ancestrais, que eles bem, eles curam, eles têm o poder de dizer é, o que cura, o que não cura, eles têm o poder de dizer o que o remédio que vamos tomar, que vai servir para aquela doença, e esses são o, o que nós devemos acreditar e, e não, não deixar perder. Elas falam que a gente tem que, tipo, tomar cuidado. Em todo canto tem espírito, tem um dono. Que no caso, na água tem, são a, é a mãe d'água, na mata é a mãe da mata, que é a curupira. E esses espíritos que 
andam por aí, que no caso são os donos de lá. So beautiful that uh, I there's many images in this uh, the trailer and it makes me really want to see the full story. Uh, but I, in just thinking about filmmaking techniques, I think there's some great uh, sense of uh, you withhold kind of uh, a lot of information and let us watch it first. Uh, I like the cut with the young boy. Uh, who we first see uh, without speaking, he's not speaking, but we're hearing his voice. And then uh, we're just seeing him listening as the talking happens. And then it cuts to him talking. And uh, it's a technique that I just thought it represents a kind of unusual choice and brave choice maybe. Um, I wonder what inspired you in that moment when you were came to editing him. Uh, to include that shot of him. Acho, é, nesse contexto do Gabriel, não teve algo em si que me inspirou assim. Eu, quando eu pensei, editei, eu queria fazer uma introdução, sabe, das pessoas, mostrar elas sem ser falando, só mostrando elas ali. É, no momento antes da entrevista, é, para que as pessoas pudessem ver elas realmente como elas são, sem estar tá falando, porque às vezes, quando eu não dizia que eu estava gravando, eu colocava para gravar e eu não falava. Então, as pessoas estavam sendo elas ali. E quando eu falava, estou gravando, elas mudavam um pouco. Então, esse, o intu, acho que o intuito assim, era mostrar um, um, um pouco isso. E esse filme, ele fala sobre a questão da espiritualidade. E para os 13 povos da região do Baixo Tapajós, é, a espiritualidade é muito forte. Nossa, assim, é, a gente fala muito que se o nosso corpo... É, não está com o espírito fortalecido, o nosso corpo está fraco, não tem como a gente lutar. E a espiritualidade aqui na nossa região é algo que nos conecta com nossos ancestrais, é o que nos dá força para nossa para a gente lutar pelo nosso território, pela nossa cultura. E falar sobre isso também é muito importante para mim, porque eu venho de uma linhagem aonde a espiritualidade é muito forte. A minha mãe, ela recebeu um dom de, da espiritualidade é, desde criança e isso se passou para mim. É, então, assim, falar sobre isso, eu desde criança eu ouvia meu avô falando sobre história de encantados, né? De que aqui no Rio tem uma outra, tem um outro mundo debaixo do nosso rio. Então ele falava desses espíritos, dos espíritos que protegiam, é, que protegem, né? O nosso território protege a gente e de como a gente precisa respeitá-los. Então é, mostrar isso para outras pessoas é muito importante para mim, porque aqui na região, aqui no Brasil em si quando a gente se fala é, sobre espiritualidade indígena, é, sobre os encantados que vivem dentro do rio e na floresta, como a curupira, é, as pessoas demonizam muito esses espíritos. É, as pessoas dizem que é uma lenda, é como se já que não existisse, sabe? Como se fosse algo inventado do nosso imaginário. E nós sabemos que não é. Nós sabemos que isso é, é um espírito do que é que é do bem. É um espírito que está aqui, está protegendo no, a nossa floresta, está nos protegendo, está nos fortalecendo. Então mostrar isso é muito importante e principalmente é, mostrar é, jovens é, que tem essa conscientização, porque a gente sabe que hoje é, o mundo ele tem muitas coisas que acabam fazendo com que a juventude é, ela se desconecte um pouco é, da sua cultura. 
e ela acaba tendo é, mais vontade de querer saber de outras coisas do que a nossa cultura. Então, é, esse ato da gente sentar numa roda de conversa e conversar com nossos anciões é algo que está se perdendo. Então, a gente poder registrar essas histórias desses anciões falando sobre é, os, o mundo dos encantados, porque em cada povo, em cada lugar... É, cada um tem suas histórias com os encantados. Então, é, como eu tenho uma espiritualidade muito forte, eu já tive é, experiências de ter contatos com esses espíritos de várias formas. Eles se presenciaram para mim de, de vários momentos. É, eu queria, nesse filme, é, mostrar para as pessoas isso. Eu queria que as pessoas vissem que o rio ele não é só o rio. Ele, a floresta não é só floresta e como nós precisamos re, respeitar o rio, a floresta e esses seres que estão presentes neles. Ah, thank you. That uh, I think is uh, coming across in your film, and uh, I'm in, I'm seeing that there was uh, you have uh, needed to find your own language of filmmaking and uh, that leads me to a question i want to ask all three of you uh about inspiration uh from other filmmaking uh which i think sometimes uh you know to have something in your uh your past that where you've experienced filmmaking making meaning uh in a way you maybe was surprising and it may inform how you go about your work now. And maybe it's not filmmaking, maybe it's another piece of art or something. Uh, but I want to start maybe with you, Keenan, uh, to ask you, have, have you seen any other uh, films, uh, indigenous filmmaking or otherwise, that you feel inspired by that you can share with us? Um. I mentioned it briefly in my story before, but my main inspiration is from, uh, if not Aston Hu, and also Rekamnim Santara and Indonesia Nature Film Society, because I I was accompanying them since I was a child, since I was small. And I think my earliest memories when I was like seven or eight years old, seeing them. And when they're finished filming, they would also show show the footage to the people and also show films from other places to show that we, because most of their films are about indigenous people. And when they show it in different places throughout the archipelago, throughout the earth, the earth, um, it just shows how similar most cultures are, how we still have a lot of the same basic values, such as protecting the forest and how important it is to us, how, how to manage the forest too, and also to only take how much you need, nothing less and nothing more. And from their films is what inspired me. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I, I can, uh, that was similar to my experience with If Not Us Then Who, but it wasn't even called that. Uh, to us, you know, first, it, uh, some of the work that I saw when I first met Paul Redman, who is director of the If Not uh, Us Then Who, 15 years ago in a film festival in Brazil, uh, it was in Manaus, and uh, I was seeing these images of uh, people and telling their own stories and uh, the uh, seeing them if, if for the first time I had been in Brazil and then seeing these stories from all around the world being told has uh, kind of inspired me later, having known him so long, to be on the board because I think uh, it's a great, important work. Um, 
I think there's sometimes some images that just uh, strike me and uh, his films of, of the um, illegal forum in Indonesia, uh, where the stark uh, stories of people coming away injured with bloody blood on their chests and head injuries and things. And they're still trying to talk to describe what they just had been going through. And I think uh, uh, those kind of, th that kind of moment was really what um, always I refer to when I think about the challenges of trying to protect the forest in Indonesia and all around the world. And so I wanted to ask, uh, um, maybe Yanda, your Yanda, if you were uh, with us to talk about what uh, previous film moment or film that might have inspired you. He may have gone. He <laughs> may <laughs> have gone. There we are. Good. Sí, 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 les escuché. Bueno, a mí, okay, cuando, eh, cuando vi eh, un trabajo de mi compañero, es Heriberto Guaringa de Sarayaco, hizo una película, Los Hijos del Jaguar, cuando una empresa petrolera ingresaba a su territorio, él tenía una cámara chiquita y grabó todo lo que sucedió, y vi su trabajo como tenía impacto en el mundo a mí él fue el, uno de los que me inspiró su trabajo es mi vecino en la selva él vive no sé cuál muy lejos como eh, muchos kilómetros lejos de mi comunidad él es quichua entonces somos vecinos eh, con záparas y quichua entonces él es el el que me empujó a conocer también si ustedes si nosotros no lo hacemos entonces quién conocí también a ellos su trabajo como su colectivo virtual su forma de trabajo apoyo a los nuevos cineastas amazónicos a través de ellos también me han empujado a crecer a conocer más de este mundo mágico que es el cine que es una herramienta muy importante para nosotros que nos fortalece eh, ellos han sido mis 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 profesores shimanos tecnológicos shimanos sabios tecnológicos y ellos han sido los que me han a, a ayudado a mí a crecer y todo lo que aprendí ha sido mirando cómo el otro hace cómo edita acompañándome ac acompañando en los rodajes un día hice un viaje desde Ecuador hasta Brasil por por, el, por la cuenca amazónica, entonces ahí miraba a muchos amigos como gra, grababan, todo eso, yo estuve mirando todo eso y luego yo mismo empecé a editar, a, a ver otras cosas para poder montar mi primer video. Eso ha sido mi inspiración mi, desde que vi este mundo. Ah, good. For you. Thanks for sharing that. And, uh, and um, I know we're running a little bit out of time, but I wanted to ask you, Priscilla, just to hear a little bit about what you, what moment in a film that you saw that inspired you to pursue this work. Hmm? I think, começando pelo momento, the moment, I think the moment that inspired me was after I discovered about essa essa herança espiritual que eu recebi da minha família e foi logo depois que eu tive é, essas experiências esses contatos com os encantados tanto com o encantado do rio e quanto com o encantado da floresta é, foi algo que foi muito forte para mim e deu um outro rumo na minha vida então é, eu queria mostrar para as pessoas um pouco do que tinha acontecido comigo e e fazer com que ela sentisse pelo menos que fosse um por cento do que eu senti é, eu acho que foi isso essa questão da espiritualidade e eu tenho um filme é, que ele é indi ele é produzido é, roteirizado por um é, antropólogo indígena aqui da minha região 
mas também tem não indígenas que participaram, mas foi um filme que me inspirou muito, que se chama A Terra dos Encantados, que é um filme que fala muito sobre a espiritualidade também da região aqui do Baixo Tapajós, é, que fala, é, fala muito é, com anciões, é, então tem muito, é um documentário com muita entrevista de anciões que também já se foram, é, fala da resistência deles, de quanto, da luta, de quanto se afirmar quanto um quanto a um povo indígena, porque a gente sabe que no Brasil a gente é, sofre muito preconceito, é, muito racismo contra os povos indígenas, principalmente é, aqueles povos que perderam a língua, é, que de, foram catequizados, e isso aconteceu aqui na minha região. Então, esse filme, é, Terra dos Encantados, é, conta histórias de encantos, que conta a história de espiritualidade, mas também conta a história de resistência é, de mulheres e homens que alguns já se foram, que lutaram é, e se afirmaram a, quanto povos indígenas, é, buscaram falar sobre resistência e essas pessoas que se foram foram que fizeram com que hoje eu tivesse aqui tendo essa oportunidade de estar falando com vocês então é, foi, é, esse filme é um grande aprendizado para a gente aqui da nossa região e também tem outros é, parentes indígenas tem o Vevito Pianco a Xaninka ele é um grande cineasta e ele é um líder espiritual também então, como eu tenho essa ligação muito forte com a questão da espiritualidade, eu troquei muitas ideias com ele sobre é, como a gente produzir um filme e mostrar a nossa visão, essa questão da espiritualidade na tela, como que a gente pudesse fazer com que as pessoas vessem né, um pouco daquilo que a gente vê. É, tem uma outra cineasta, que é a Grace Guarani, que é uma mulher que me inspira muito, porque ela é uma mulher que nos seus filmes fala muito sobre a luta, é, sobre a questão da espiritualidade também, mas ela é uma mulher que ela luta diariamente para afirmar que se nós, povos indígenas, a gente pode sim estar tá numa tela de cinema, a gente pode ter nossos filmes em festivais, quem sabe não ganhar um Oscar. Então, ela... é ganhou um festival, ela faz viagens internacionais falando sobre o filme dela. Então, eu acho isso muito importante, porque aqui, eu não sei como que é muito nos outros países, mas eu sei que aqui no Brasil é um racismo muito grande contra nós, povos indígenas, que as pessoas acham que nós não temos capacidades e que nós não podemos produzir um conteúdo de qualidade, produzir um filme de qualidade. E nós estamos mostrando que a gente pode sim, porque a gente tem esse conhecimento ancestral e tem esse conhecimento das ferramentas. Então, a gente consegue mostrar algo para as pessoas, a gente consegue causar uma sensibilidade nas pessoas, a gente consegue mostrar sobre a nossa luta, sobre a nossa ancestralidade, é, sobre as invasões que acontecem no nosso território. A gente consegue mostrar de várias formas, e eu acho que... Oh, that forma. is... Ah, ok. Yeah, I think that really sums it, sums it up, Priscilla. I mean, for to, to uh, all three of you today, I know we have to wrap it up now, but all three of you, I think, have shown that you have knowledge and the, you have a message that you have to give. And uh, uh, not that the, an Oscar is a, a, a terrific representation of uh, uh, great filmmaking because there's, but the world attention should come to these stories. And I think you are all three of you uh, doing a great, uh, and you're on a great journey and I look forward to hearing and seeing more of your work. So I think that's about it, that all that we have time for today. But Michael, I think you're going to take it over and uh, bring us to the last part of this, uh, the programming for today, which is about how to tell our stories. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Keenan, Priscilla, and Yanda. Uh, I would have met uh, Keenan uh, last year, and I know, you know, I've seen some of his films, and he does quite a lot of work. I've also would have met Jan, but I've not uh, seen uh, or met uh, Priscilla. But it's important for us as uh, Indigenous peoples to tell our stories, and I think one of the things that I, I got out of this, and it was Keenan who said it, that, you know, we need to tell stories from our own perspectives, and I think this is really important 
that we are the ones telling our stories because I think we are the ones who are better able to bring over our stories. Yes, learning some uh, storytelling techniques can help us, but it's important that we tell our stories from our own perspectives. So thank you, uh, Bill, for uh, holding that panel. And we have one last uh, session that we will have this afternoon. And then after the session, we will have some DJ uh, music uh, by uh, DJ Eriki do Brasil. Uh, he will take us, you know, finalize things for us this afternoon. But before we get into that, um, I'd like to introduce you to our next host, um, who will be carrying the, the next session. And this is the last session uh, for today, well, except for the, the DJ music. Um, and this panel will be, uh, it's titled, our next panel is titled One Tip Storytellers. Um, and it's about news journalism uh, made new, uh, uh, a look at the efforts being made to diversify storytelling and news coverage to include local and indigenous community voices. Um, it is important that, that we understand uh, that you know there, there are diversifications that will happen and it's interesting and we'll hear more about that in this last panel but remember that this is being brought to you our village here is being brought to you um by if not us then who um as well as the hip-hop caucus and the uh guardians of the forest and it's all about uh connectivity and networking uh with, it's a solutions based approach we're looking to find solutions rather than talk about issues but we want to also talk about what the solutions are because that we have the solutions, and, you know, we must put those solutions out there. Um, so today's, uh, the last session will be hosted by president of, if not Austin, who? Uh, Mina Setra, and Mina is in Indonesia, and I'm sure Kinan as well is in Indonesia, and uh, it's after midnight over there. So, you know, we really appreciate them making that time uh, to be here with us tonight. So I'd like to hand you over to Mina Setra, who is the president of If Not Us, Then Who, to take us through the next uh, activity. Mina? Hello, Michael. Uh, good to see you, brother. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, it's been, some t it's been so long. I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, thank you so much. That was a really inspiring panel. Uh, thank you, Bill, to bring that panels with our inspiring, talented young filmmakers. And now we are going to the next panel, uh, which called Wanted Storytellers. It's one of my, I think my favorite uh, uh, topic. Wanted story, you know, as, as an indigenous also, uh, many times I ask uh, what kind of stories that we can we can bring for different purposes and um how, who do we serve actually with the, with our stories and uh what what stories that move people and m many of these questions actually we we will have some very um uh important and senior uh journalists very expert who are already working on this field and I would like to introduce first, I hope they're all here already, uh, all the panelists. Uh, first, we have Maria Guaman uh, from Tauna. Uh, she's been developing competition and training to encourage local filmmakers in Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, Maria, are you in? Are you here? Hello? Maria, we can hear you. No podemos, no lo podemos oírte, Maria. Hay un problema con el micrófono. No. Hello? Okay. Uh, oh, since Mar Maria still have problems with uh, the communications, Maybe we can move first. Yeah, I'll go to. Ju Are you there, Maria? Is it you? No. Okay, let's move. Uh, Maria, I will I'll be back to you later. Um, we'll move to Julian Brave Noise Cat. 
Hola. Uh, Julian is. Uh... Hola, hola. Oh, okay. Okay, Maria, welcome. Uh, it's good to hola. see you. And... Ahí me escuchan? Yeah. It's really good to see you, and I've learned about your work, and we are really want to hear your story and your your talk. But but before I would like to I would like to ask you, um, how are you supporting storytellers, and why do you think this is important? Muchas gracias por la pregunta. Eh, buenas tardes y días con todas y todos. Pues nuestro trabajo desde Tauna es, eh, consideramos que es importante para la formación de comunicadores y co comunicadoras porque lo que soñamos es crear una red, una red de periodistas, una red de comunicadores profesionales desde territorio que puedan compartirnos sus experiencias, que puedan compartirnos sus historias desde su propia perspectiva. Adicional a esto, crear una red es súper importante porque nos permitiría eh, generar alianzas no solo en las unidades que están en la selva, sino con los vecinos. Como ya lo hablaba ya es importante como conectarnos con los vecinos de los otros pueblos ancestrales y adicional también con organizaciones internacionales, con organizaciones nacionales que nos permitan como generar esta ancla para podernos, no solo como fundación, como organización Tauna, sino también como un colectivo profesional de personas que lo que hace es a través del cine, en nuestro caso, pues eh, denunciar, hablar, compartir las realidades que tenemos desde territorio con el fin de que éstas puedan ser tomadas en cuenta. Okay, thank you so much for that. It reminds me to what of the young filmmakers just now saying about their inspirations, why they do the films. Uh, I will be back to you later. We, we have a very short amount of time, so sorry for that, but we'll be back. Um, I'm going to Julian Brave Noiscat. Uh, he's an indigenous activist and also a writer. Um, he has write bunch of, uh, write in bunch of media in print and online, and won several awards, also possess his work. Uh, Julian, are you there? Yes, can you uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, Excellent. Yeah, my first question to you is, um, what moment you realize uh, that you want to be a writer? And what inspired you to be a writer? Oh man, uh, that's a more personal first question I thought I was going to get. <laughs> Because you write uh, well, firstly, so much already, so. <laughs> uh, so firstly, I just want to say wait uh, which means hello everyone in uh, my people's language, the Sequetmoch language. Uh, Julian Brave Noise Cat wins quext. Uh, my name is Julian Brave Noise Cat. Um, it's good to, to talk to you guys all today. Um, I guess to answer the question of, uh, you know, why I decided to be a writer, um, you know, my, my sense is, you know, I'm a, I'm a indigenous person who grew up in the United States. Uh, my people are from the Canadian side of the border, um, but I grew up in the United States and, um, my family is, uh, my father is native and, and is an artist. And my mother is not native. And when I was a young man, my, um, dad for for reasons uh related to his own sort of um struggles uh left our family when i was very young um and that combined with you know growing up in a country where we don't talk at all about uh the history of native people we don't uh acknowledge even in some places that there are people who are indigenous to the places that we come from uh made me from a very young age want to you know, firstly, um, you know, feel as though I wanted to understand my father's story and with that, my people's story and, you know, understand why um, he faced the the challenges in life that he did um, and why he and that led him to leave. And then in the bigger sense to, to understand, um, you know, what was our story in place here as, as Native people uh, in this country. And I think that 
that was something that that drove me towards books, that drove me towards writing, uh, that drove me towards the the intellectual production of other native writers like Sherman Alexie, who was really formative for me when I was a young young kid, um, and I think is still actually in a lot of ways the sort of energy that drives me to report and write uh, and and do journalism today. So it's it's that sort of trying to chase the story from both a personal and then also a sort of more social and, and macro perspective. Thank you so much, Julian, for that story. Uh, oh, I, as the same things, I will be back to you after this. Um, I'm going to go to Jonathan Watt. Okay, this person I know. Uh, in 2016, He's been following us in our uh, Guardian of the Forest tour campaign in, in Europe. Jonathan, are you here? Jonathan Watts is the um, with the Guardians, the Global Environmental Editor and Board, and the Board uh, at Pulitzer. Jonathan, are you here? Hello? Hi, Mina. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. I ah, can hear lo you. <laughs> lovely to see you again. It's been a long time. I'm very happy yeah. to join. And this, we've been really impressed by this event organized by, uh, if not us, then who? It's great. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here, Jonathan. Um, I have questions. First questions to you is, um, we would like to know, um, could you explain how you are engaging with indigenous storytellers and how they can engage with you. I remember you chasing me once with all your questions and I was running away. <laughs> <laughs> you were, you were a very difficult <laughs> subject to, to, to interview Mina. Um, well, th the main way with the Guardian, let me, let me explain that first of all, was uh, that we worked for more than a year on a series that we called the defenders. This was basically guardians of uh, the environment, guardians of the land, and the majority of them uh, were indigenous people. Uh, and the perspective was this: that essentially there is a series of conflicts taking place around the world. They are usually small-scale conflicts in very remote places, and most, most of them are ignored. Many of them are, are not reported. There's very little justice um, and a lot of impunity. And if you take each of these cases separately, they seem very far away and distant from the lives of our readers. Uh, but when you put them together, they reveal a pattern of something that is taking place across the world. And that is the rush to secure, to, to extract resources in uh, ever more distant from major economic capitals, distant from economic capitals, parts of the world. So this is taking place uh, across, particularly the, the global south and the, the developing world. Um, and I think, that in any conflict, the, the last thing the dominant power wants anybody to do is to reveal the human cost of their victory. Um, and that, that's true in a, in a conventional war, and that's true in this kind of war. And it is a war, I think. It's a war against nature, it's a war against diversity, and it's a war in which so-called civilization and economic development are trashing more and more of the planet uh, and pushing um, nature, wildlife, diversity uh, into the margins. And often at those margins, it is um, indigenous groups who are under the most pressure and who are fighting to hold on to what, what's left, which, which used to be a lot of land and, now, and often it's very marginal land. And I think what we tried to do with the Defender series was, first of all, we work with Global Witness and we put a number on the number of, 
of economic uh, of environmental defenders who are being killed every year then it's not just a number that's not good enough then then the names then the photos and then where possible the stories and we went out and and, and talked to people in the philippines in mindanao uh in in colombia in brazil in in many parts of the world in south africa and and really try to show the stories the, the the suffering they've been to so that people can connect and then to link that to the products that people in the in the wealthier parts of the world are using that often cause this suffering or are indirectly or directly connected to this suffering so i think the main thing for us is to try to pull together all the stories to show these aren't just individual remote cases but there is a pattern there's a structure and you have to deal with that structure not the individual case and the last thing i'd say uh, i've got lots more to say but i don't want to take up everyone's time um would be that it it's very important to address this uh, on an emotional level you have to get the facts right you have to get the story right always um you have to go if you can not not easy right now because of covid um but you also have to engage people on an emotional level so that means really telling the story of a person so that you can sympathize with them feel angry with them feel sad for them um and i think that's what we've tried to do because i'm an environment uh editor and, and often the environment is a niche that that is like almost like science climate science or 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 or, or the other side is often it's like wildlife conservation but i think that's that's too small and we need to uh make it more political we need to make it more economic we need to say it's about water and air and food and most of all it's about people so i uh, i'll leave it there there's plenty more uh, I, i'd be glad to say but i look forward to hearing what the others um have to contribute to okay thank you john it is really a brave things that the the media do you know because many times uh media doesn't want to publish our stories because they think that it's not interesting especially now like in indonesia many media say we are tired with conflict issues people are tired of conflicts or land grabbing issues this kind of things no and they want to have more uh, like other stories that come make people feeling peaceful but that's not the world that we live in So we'll back to that later. I think um, I want to introduce next uh, panelist, uh, Carla Mendes uh, from Mangabay. Uh, uh, she's been she's Brazilian contributing editor, uh, edit both spot news and feature pertaining to Brazil, uh, manage feature series on women-led conservations. indigenous communities and illegal deforestation she also does in depth investigating investigating reporting and data driven investigative project uh carla are you here i saw some comments uh from you uh d- during the young the youth film makers so i believe yeah. you are here <laughs> wow hi everyone it's me Hello, can carla. you hear yes, yes. Yeah, it's Thank been a you. pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. It's yeah. Uh, be- yeah, so I have questions. Um this is interesting what you are doing. How how are you supporting these local storytellers? And what makes uh, a good story and what doesn't? This is really important because sometimes we are confused. What story we should tell because pe- other people said no, that is not good stories. Some other advice that nobody will be interested in that you know so this kind of things i think the advice from you guys maybe can help us to to you know to be better storytellers sure well the good news is that monga bay is highly interested in these stories from indigenous people we are mostly focused on uh, tropical forests and indigenous people and this event is really timely because i'm playing a role in trying to build a network of indigenous people, river dwellers and local contributors from Olga Bay. I've been thinking about this for a while. I've been a reporter for many years and for a year now I've been doing this double role, editor but doing my in-depth reporting and I've been thinking about 
a way to bring these people to our network because sometimes something happened, you, you are not there, but they are there. And as they explained, almost everyone has a phone so they can get photos, footage, and, um, and actually we, and then during this, pro I've been thinking about this and then COVID-19 came with, and then somehow it kind of speed up the process because then I brought it and Mongabe is really open to this. And I've just uh, included the first indigenous filmmaker to our network from Media India, who does an amazing work here. And then we are doing a story about the women uh, warriors of the forest in Karu indigenous reserve. They do an amazing job with the guardians of the forest there, the Guajajara people. And we, then I brought Erisvan Boni Guajajara to be a contributor and we are buying his footage. You know, he has a, a video already on YouTube with an interview in the, the Warriors, but then we are buying B-roll and another material to do a video for this story. And then we are also changing procedures, you know, because to include people, you think about language. And Monga Bay, as it's based on the US, all the documents are in English. And then I said, no, we need those documents because you have contracts or a contributor service to be filled. And then I sent them to translation legal to a Brazilian lawyer as well. And then to have it, you know, it just happened to happen two weeks ago, you know. So it's, it's really interesting. And I've been seeing the amazing work that many indigenous filmmakers are doing. I want all of them to be working for Manga Bay. And, and it's good because, you know, we, we pay for footage. You know, I think that's, that's a way to recognize the work they're doing, not just footage, but I think that we could think about uh, share the bylines for stories you know, because sometimes the person isn't a journalist, but the person has the information, is on the ground, and then he or she can team up with a reporter who works for Monga Bay. And then to build that story, I think that's a way to have a more inclusive journalism. We need that. We cannot keep doing just a colonized journalism anymore. So that's the work we are doing and about what's a good story I think as um, the previous panel is uh, some, I forgot her name, but while well, the, the producer said, we have in journalism to ask the question on who, where, why, why and these things. But I think that beyond the W8 questions that we need to answer, one of the things that we need more now, I think is try to bring emotion to, to our stories, to try to find a way to engage people because there are, too much information everywhere. People are not reading long texts. They are not watching long videos. So storytelling is really important. And of course, to think about unique facts, unique approach. And one thing that we're also doing is that we're not only willing to report about problems. We do, and I personally do a lot of investigations on into the problems, but you also need to show solutions because there are many interesting projects as one that people show to rip forest areas. So we need to show people that it's possible to change, to stop deforestation, to, 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 to live from the land, you know? So basically it's this, and of course there are some journalistic journalist, uh, journalist standards to follow, but it's a process, you know, I think the person is not required to know everything we can do it bit by bit. And as I said, I think that teaming up with other people, we can do great stories. Thank you, Carla. It's, um, I, my, I'm, I myself ad, admire the work of Mongabai in Indonesia. Mongabai Indonesia also been really supportive to our work, indigenous uh, stories in Indonesia. And, and it's been long years we've been working together or different different things and um, yeah, it's really it's really good to have media that supporting our our cause. Um, we will we will talk more about this. And I'm going now to uh, Rachel Stretcher. 
uh, not from National Geographic. Uh, Rachel runs the fellowship for indigenous storytellers. Okay, for you are who storytellers, you might want to know Rachel. <laughs> um, Rachel, are you here? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, Mina. Um, I do have to clarify that we don't have a fellowship specifically for indigenous storytellers, but we do work hard to um, recruit and work with and, um, and support indig indigenous storytellers as part of our grants and fellowships work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us. Um, my first question is, um, okay, this is, a, <laughs> what makes National Geographic different from other news organizations? And well, how, are you planning, how are you planning to support indigenous people's uh, stories? Thank you, maybe Mina, you can, and thanks for, for having questions. me. Maybe that's too long. You can you can answer the first question. Well, I um I have to admit that I can't quite answer the first question, and this is a good opportunity for me to clarify that um I sit on the nonprofit side of National Geographic, where we work on supporting remarkable storytellers and researchers um, and educators and technologists from around the world. Um, we work quite closely with the production side and the publication side, and they work in many ways as a megaphone for the work of our um, our explorers, as we call them. So I um, I, I will not comment on what um, the specifics of the editorial side. However, I can talk about um, how we feel about um, supporting work from all over the world, and that is very much that. Um, you know, I when I, I was asked this question the other day about what it means to decolonize grant making for um, for storytelling. And I've been thinking about this ever since. And part of it, I believe, is that um, is to flip this notion that grant programs are are helping others and that it's coming from this Western notion of supporting people who need it, but rather recognizing that by diversifying and ensuring that we're, we're being more inclusive of voices that we may not have heard of as much in global media outlets, um, we are better served, right? And so um, truly recognizing that in financially supporting some of this work, it is um, making our global media conversations about these topics better. I'm gonna get really specific now because I think that's what people may have been here for. Um, and so we have grants, um, we call them our exploration grants. Uh, Julian actually has one of them. So he's, he's one of our explorers um, and is pursuing a really exciting project in, in Canada. Um, but we also have a grant that's specifically designed to tell stories about tropical rainforests and very specific calls out local and indigenous voices as part of that. And Michael is a grantee as part of that initiative as well. Um, that opportunity is open still and I encourage people to look into it and, and see if that's a good fit for, for their storytelling. And when I say storytelling, I mean photography, filmmaking, um, audio projects, we see it very broadly. And so um, Michael applied as a, as a vlogger um, Julian is doing a really exciting interdisciplinary project that's um, sort of challenging traditional notions of what a museum might be. Um, Julian, you should correct me if I'm describing it wrong. Um, but so we describe this in really um, broad terms. Um, and we have a that's open right now called Equity, in the, which um, aligns with much of what Jonathan Watts has been talking about, which is to say that the environmental movement has historically been talking a lot, um, a lot about, you know, polar bears and the land, which is really important, but often has left out the fact that there are people who are stewards of that land or who live on that land um, and can't be forgotten when we talk about the importance of biodiversity or protecting land. And so, um, that's a, a project that's designed to tell more stories of environmental justice and environmental racism from around the world, which will very much be prioritizing voices that are historically not centered in media narratives. Um, and then the third one I wanna talk about because it's open right now and it's funding work consistently is um, 
telling stories around the COVID pandemic. And that may feel separate from what we're talking about right now, but it's really interested in intersectionality and um, the way in which inequality is represented through um, through the virus. And we're, we're actively looking for stories from indigenous communities in that space. Um, and I will say the other piece of this is we very much value these stories in part because um, when you invest in stories where people tell talk about their own communities, we're finding particularly with this COVID fund that um, people tell stories of the heroes, of resilience, of wicked challenges, but of the solutions to those, which is something that Carla mentioned as well. And, um, and I love seeing that kind of story. Um, you never wanna tell your own story from the perspective of victimhood. And so while sometimes we would see outsiders come in and portray people as victims, when we see people telling their own stories, it's a very different way of seeing it. So um, I'll stop talking because I think I'm talking a lot, but um, that's those are some opportunities that we, we offer. Yeah, I don't want to stop any of you because all of this, this is really interesting discussions and very important one, I think, because we are actually we are now talking about how people see us as indigenous people. And sometimes we are confused about what mirror they want to reflect. They want us to reflect, no? And sometimes our real stories are not really um, taken into account because it's not interesting. You know, some personal stories, small, simple stories, people want something that is big and, you know, but sometimes that's not it. Uh, that's why I want to go back to Maria Gaman. Maria, how do you see these uh, uh, young people that that um, joining the, the competitions, um, how do you see the, the, their story through through their perspective, their lens? Maria. Bueno, um, desde Tauna, um, nosotros bueno somos una organización muy nueva en el tema de producción audiovisual. Uh, En, en este espacio que hemos tenido de formación, eh, para nosotros el espacio de creación de, de nuevos eh, productores, de nuevos comunicadores, es súper importante, porque entendemos que unirnos a estos nuevos jóvenes es un proceso de construir para resistir desde territorio, eh, teniendo en cuenta que nosotros somos unos... Eh, Eh, acompañantes y guías de las personas que tienen una cámara desde la selva porque eh, y, y en esa guía que les damos pues nosotros alentamos a que lo que ellos construyan no tiene por qué tener una, un límite o una forma ya establecida entonces es eh, ese hecho de poder dar esta amplitud a las personas que quieren compartir con nosotros sus miradas, sus colores, sus sonidos, desde lo que ellos mismos sienten, para nosotros es una experiencia riquísima, es una experiencia alentadora, es una experiencia constructora para nosotros. Eh, estamos convencidos de que formar comunicadores, periodistas desde la selva, formar es empoderar. Y lo que queremos con ese empoderamiento es entregarles herramientas digitales para que ellos y ellas aprendan, que es lo que yo estoy de acuerdo con Jonathan que dijo, que es importante también poner en estos días. No debemos quedar más como comunicadores en estos espacios y tener miedo a no meternos en algo, sino que es súper importante ser valientes, formar en ser valientes y también formar en esa valentía, en la responsabilidad que tienes al compartir una imagen, al compartir una palabra, contextualizar bien, analizar bien, consecuencias, reacciones. Todo eso es un proceso que como Tauna estamos recién entendiendo y nos ha ido súper bien. Entendemos también que, mira, en, un, en la primera experiencia que tuvimos en el marco de COVID-19, pues una de nuestras frases también es, somos diciendo, haciendo. Entonces, un día, pues decidimos lanzar un concurso desde plataformas digitales y nuestro primer concurso, el lanzamiento es el Bauasi. Ese fue nuestro primer concurso que lanzamos de cortos 
eh, que, que se podían grabar con teléfono. Y, re, y realmente no pensamos que iba a tener un impacto como el que tuvimos. Eh, tuvimos respuestas de varias comunidades. Y esto también me uno porque a, a lo que creo que, no recuerdo quién fue el que lo dijo hace un momento, pero las respuestas, pese a que fue el, el tema de COVID-19, es un tema súper preocupante. Tuvimos videos muy propositivos, muy fuera de lo común, muy, muy, muy interesantes en la mirada que las personas tienen del COVID y eh, fue como una muy buena primera experiencia que tuvimos de formación en este contexto de COVID, ¿no? de no poder salir, de no poder encontrarnos. Eh, adicional a esto, creo que también eh, en la pregunta que tú nos hacías de cómo eh, nos relacionamos con estos nuevos jóvenes, eh, la relación y las experiencias, la relación que hemos tenido nos deja como una buena experiencia eh, que estas tecnologías nos han ayudado a recopilar información de la memoria histórica de los pueblos y como comunicadores y como comunicadoras de pueblos y nacionalidades, pues esto es, esto es maravilloso porque nos permite profesionalizar el cine generar documentos, líneas de tiempo, bases de datos, de fotografías que quizás se están perdiendo y ahora con el trabajo que estamos haciendo con apoyo de personas que están en territorio que quizás alguna vez tomaron una foto, grabaron un audio y ahora nosotros estamos en conjunto recopilando eso, pues es una experiencia súper buena que hemos tenido de, de lograr que el cine eh, sea una una forma de nuevamente eh, poner en, en la pantalla una memoria histórica que está en riesgo de perderse. En otra de las, de las cosas que hemos logrado como Tauna en este poquito tiempo que tenemos de vida también como experiencia es de entender los desafíos de los que hablaban también mis compañeros de panel y desafíos que uno de los principales desafíos es el financiamiento es el acceso que nosotros tenemos desde acá a financiamientos, a becas, a tener acceso a canales que nos permitan que las convocatorias lleguen y cómo llenar esas convocatorias desde las personas que inclusive en algunos casos no tienen yeah. internet. Pero ese es un desafío que todavía estamos avanzando y vamos bien. Thank you so much, Maria. Really, 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 really nice to, to hear your talk. And you know, sometimes I wish uh, the the uh, inspirations is also like a virus. But the, the thing is, it's not yet a pandemic. <laughs> Especially it's very inspiration to make movies, to make stories, you know. So that's I'm going to Julian now. Um, Julian, since you are a, a writer, you know, in in our experience in indigenous communities, uh, including our indigenous youth. It is so hard uh, to encourage people to write, and it's not really easy things to do, and and and, and, and it's not easy to find indigenous writer too. Um, what what can you advise? And what is the tricks uh, when you write stories that can really tell who you are? Imina, unfortunately, Julian had to leave. Yeah, then, but oh. we can go to Jonathan on that one, I'm sure, Mina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, so sorry, guys. I didn't know that you he left already. Jonathan, are you still there? You're not leaving as well, no, Jonathan? You don't get rid of me that easily. Mina. Yeah, I know. That's why. <laughs> So, yeah, so my question to Juliana, maybe you can help answer that too, because, you know, it's really, it's not easy to find our own writers, like the indigenous writers. We have now made more and more uh, indigenous uh, filmmakers, video makers, you know, but writers, it's not really easy to find because it's need some, I don't know, everything is need skill. So wh what is the trick? What? what people want to hear when you write your own stories or from the stories that you see from your community? Well, well I, I think sometimes we can't just write the stories that the readers want. We cannot just try to be popular. 
Otherwise, if we do that, we just uh, follow in the patterns of the past and we need to find new patterns and new languages and new, new ways of talking about things. And I think with regards to indigenous storytelling, the traditions are often so different. Um, and in some cases, there are oral traditions rather than written traditions. And so sometimes they didn't, do not transfer across very easily. And in fact, I, I've, you know, I, I, I confess I, I've done so many interviews and written so many stories um, about um, uh, the situation in indigenous uh, communities. Um, and, and I find it very difficult. I, I, I feel that I cannot always connect as well as I want to. I, I really want to understand everything, but I, I feel I have a lot of weight of colonial history and so on. Um, and, and so I, I feel I have to make an extra effort. Um, but I, I think the key is to find bridges and to take time. And it's all about communicating. And it's all about learning how to communicate. It's about learning other people's language. Writing a news story or a news feature is a certain kind of skill and a certain kind of language. And it's a different skill whether you want to communicate with, <coughs> sorry, a, a, a regional or a local community or whether you want to reach an international audience. Uh, and, and sometimes you need, people need help um, because making that bridge is not easy unless you have ha a foot in both sides. So I think it, it, it's, it's up to people like me, people like you, um, to sort of encourage people to, to learn uh, the skills, but also to do it in their own way and to find their own techniques. Um, I think I think Maria's story was fantastic, and, and this this what she does was really impressive. Um, I'd like to add um, one thing, um, following from what Rachel and, and Carla was saying um, about practical things that maybe I can I can mention, and and that is that um, I'm. I, I co-funded, founded the Rainforest Journalism Fund um, with a group of uh, South, South American journalists and also international correspondents like me. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a, a $5.5 million program that covers uh, rainforests in South America, in Africa, and in Asia, particularly Indonesia. Um, and the idea is we, we wanted to start this because I, I think as a journalist, you're told always be objective, always be outside, always. But, but I think in the world now, we cannot do business as usual. And if we cannot do business as usual, we cannot do journalism as usual. So I think we, we need to find new approaches. We need to go outside of our usual patterns of, of doing work. So helping to found this organization was part of that because we know it's very expensive to go to many indigenous areas in the forest. And, and for big corporations, they have the money. For journalists, it's often difficult. And so many stories are not reported. And so the fund is to help journalists go and report this. Um, and during COVID, just in the last month, we put out a special appeal for um, stories linked to indigenous groups, linked to traditional communities in the forest um, that, that can tell of the situation under this, you know, pandemic and, and how indigenous communities are, are, are affected. Um, and I, I can send the link of that later. Um, but we are trying to get, I mean, inevitably, someone like me is, is part of the we, we have a legacy, a historical legacy that has its origins in colonialism. And we have to think of a transition so that we can share the best of what we have, but learn so that we can go beyond what we have and share uh, what we have and find solutions. And, and I hope the Rainforest Journalism Fund and a lot of the other great work we've heard about today can, can push this forward. Um, and so I would really encourage people to look at what we 
do uh, and to apply. And we would like as well to encourage these networks of indigenous journalists. Um, it's not always easy. Um, I, I, th I think it would be good to have more training centers um, or at least if not training, because that suggests top down or some kind of collaborative workshop on how to tell stories like this, exactly like this session. So there's a mutual interchange. Um, but I think, you know, it's very exciting that you're doing this. I think there is a, a bit more, a little bit more humbleness in the mainstream media that I represent that, that we can't just treat journalism as another extractive industry where we just turn up and take the story and leave nothing behind. Uh, and that is a danger. Um, and I've probably been guilty of it at some time. You know, you always try to be sympathetic and empathetic. But inevitably, sometimes you're just there for a few days and you leave. And you, you, I always try to be careful of the consequences. But there are dangers and we, we need to be super sensitive. Uh, and there needs to be more, as much interaction as is possible. Um, so sorry for talking too long. <laughs> Thank you, John. It's really, it's really inspiring and it's really important things to, to talk about. And um, that's why I want to hear also from Carla, uh, what do you, and, and also Rachel uh, later, what do you think about the discussion so far? Uh, how, how indigenous peoples can tell our story better uh, and how to move the readers or the people who watch our stories? Because at the end, we want to reach out to their heart so they can come and support us any way they, any way they can. Any thought on that? Yeah, yeah I think this will be our last last round because we have we're really running out of time now. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree with John. You know, that's exactly this. When I, you know, I thought about trying to find a way to pay indigenous people for their work because we go there, they help us with everything as a journalism role. We don't pay people, you know, to give interview to us. But then they can be paid for footage. They can be paid to work as fixers, you know, their ways. And uh, I remember in previous jobs, sometimes, oh, can you get footage? And then they send footage you don't pay. Why not if you pay footage to get from any videographer and a photographer? So I think that's the kind of movement that we, we need to think. I agree that the writing may be difficult as john said that you know for the traditional they are more oral than written but i think that collaboration is the best way in especially because i mean journalism has its own roles of course it's not you know uh, you can change it a bit but i mean there are some stuff that you need to follow when i think that the key difference is make them understand the difference between activism and journalism. You know, we can do a report about every issue, but we cannot take part of one story. And this may be one of the, of the main challenges for indigenous people, maybe, you know, because they're so involved with that. And then, you know, and for example, simple things, you need to, to listen to the other side, all the targets you are accusing. So I think that collaboration would be a, a very good way to do this even for writing i think that multimedia may be the easiest way to bring them first and from the air and so they can see for example you know this video what was the idea how it was and then to understand the sorts of we use and the same can be applied for writing mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i I have said before, and I'll just tell you what I tell people when they think about applying for a grant. I think there might be, um, okay, I think it's better. I was hearing myself. I'm still over. I, I think I'm, I think I'm hearing um, an echo of somebody. Um, uh, <laughs> can everybody mute? Okay. It's a translation issue. One second, Rachel. I think we're good. Okay. 
Thanks, everyone. No, I would echo everything that everyone said. And I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll say that I think different kind of stories are different in various contexts. Um, when told locally, um, it may be a particular kind of story that resonates with the community, the audience, but it's really important to think about who your audience is and who you're aiming for. When I look at a grant application, I ask people to make sure I understand three things. One is why are you the person to tell that story? And that may be because you have particular access to the community, maybe you're part of that community. Also that to really show us what your skills are as a filmmaker or a photographer or a spokesperson on these, these issues, we really need to understand that so we can see if it may have a distribution potential through National Geographic. Um, the other is why a story is relevant or timely and exciting. And I would ask you to go back to some of the really brilliant comments from Maya and, um, and Maria and Carla and, and Jonathan throughout the day um, to understand um, why I should be excited to tell people about this story um, and why it may be globally relevant if it is something that you're hoping is shared on, on a global stage. And then the third is, um, is what impact this story may have on the world. And that's where you get into that, that tricky space, you know, Carla mentioned, which is that we're not here to support advocacy in a traditional sense, but many stories truly have the power to change the world. Um, if told in a journalistic way. And we want to understand what the impact of that story may be on people or the planet. Um, and so those are the things that we look for um, as we're trying to assess whether something is, is um, something that we, we might be able to fund. Well, thank you so much for all of you who joining us tonight and with all of your thought. I've been taking notes a lot about what we are discussing tonight, and and I think we have to improve for for us like indigenous organizations. We can improve uh, our information communication strategies better uh, with with this kind of discussions. I hope in the future we can have another discussion like this, more in depth uh, discussion on how we can tell story uh, better. Yeah. And um, thank you again for being here. And um, we are so grateful for your participations. And to you also, John, I can see you anymore. And please uh, tell Julian, <laughs> we are happy to have he he ha him here. And I think we can send, we can pass on some questions that we have uh, for him. Thank you. And um, I'm back to you, my brother, Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mina. Uh, did a great job, and to all the panelists uh, for sharing those uh, wonderful stories. Um, indeed, I think you know this day. It was one of the best days I would have spent. You know, just listening to all the stories from right across the globe, and I think it it's it's really something that that's inspiring. It's something that inspires me, um, even though I'm already in this kind of. Uh, uh, thing you know, I do this already, but I'm inspired by listening to all the the stories uh, from the the storytellers who are out there around the world, in the Amazon basin in uh, in Amman in Mesoamerica and other other places in the world. It's it's really inspiring. Um, but before before we wrap up today, you know, I I just like to to bring us back into into perspective. You know, why why are we doing all of this? Um, but before I go there, I just want to remind us too that, you know, this is an event which was organized by, if not us, then who? Um, the Hip Hop Caucus and the Gardens of the Forest. And it's all about uh, connectivity and networking um, and looking at uh, solutions uh, rather than looking at just issues and discussing them. But we want to have solutions. Um, so as the Guardians of the Forest, one of the things, you know, we have have pressed for around the world is that there are five demands basically that we need we can add more um, however there are some five core demands as indigenous peoples as guardians of the forest that we have made uh, from time and time again to governments and uh, those five are one uh, we would like to have our lands our territorial lands our customary lands recognized and titled um, many times in many of our countries we still have issues with lands and um, many times it's because we don't have legal 
tenure to those lands. So it's one of the things that we have been pushing for around the world. Um, secondly, uh, many of our leaders have, have been criminalized. Many of our leaders are being assassinated, they're being murdered. And we want to have governments uh, recognize their role in ensuring that indigenous peoples are not criminalized, that indigenous, indigenous peoples continue to live uh, freely and happily in their lands uh, without having to be afraid of anyone. Um, but sometimes governments themselves are involved in criminalizing us as indigenous peoples. Why? Just because we are fighting for our rights to be recognized and respected. And this needs to change. And we want governments to, to recognize that. Thirdly, and I heard this come up in the, in the session as well, um, is that we would like to have direct financing to communities, direct finances to indigenous people so that uh, we can continue to, uh, with our activisms, we can continue to advocate for our rights because many times it requires resources for us to, to do these things. And we believe that having those finances come directly to indigenous peoples is one of the ways we can ensure that we continue our struggle because the struggle will continue. We know that the struggle will be there for, for years to come. But we as Indigenous peoples will continue to, to fight that struggle. And to see that happening, we would like to ensure that we have uh, direct financing coming to us. One of the critical um, elements of our fight has always been about the recognition of our right to free prior and informed consent. Too many times decisions are being made without our input, and this needs to change. Indigenous peoples need to have their rightful place at the table in any decision that involves us in any decisions that has to do anything on our lands, in our forests, we need to be involved in those decision making. So it's it's critical for uh, governments and any any proponent of projects to ensure that indigenous peoples are consulted and that we give um, our free um, informed, uh, prior, free prior and informed consent to whatever it is that um, is being made. Um, last but not least, um, we have many of our elders in our communities and our elders hold quite a lot of knowledge, ancestral knowledge for our people. And somebody talked earlier, you know, our elders have passed on uh, knowledge to us orally over the years. It, it, they may not be able to write, but they have passed on so much uh, ancestral knowledge to us over the years. And we believe that in, within those uh, knowledge, there are solutions. There are solutions to fight climate change. There are solutions to many of the issues that we face today. And we want to ensure that our knowledge is respected and it's also you know, held in a place. We have our own scientists. We may not call them scientists, right? We may call them grandfather or grandmother, but they are our elders. And right now in the Amazon basin, our elders are being threatened by the COVID-19 virus. Many of them are dying and we have seen it. And it's, it's one of the things that for us and even the storytellers, it's some of some of the things that we can start capturing as well. We need to start digitizing some of some of the the knowledge that exists out there before our elders go to the great beyond. And it's it's you know one of the, the things that personally I want to do because there is so much that you know we are still to learn from our elders. But we want uh, people to understand that that knowledge that they have that they possess can help us as well in finding solutions to fight climate change and we need to have our elders uh, you know sit at those tables where decisions are made um, with regards to, to climate change so um, I'd like to thank the the live bloggers you know we've had bloggers and you can find uh, their, their blogs on our village.us our bloggers have been there sharing their local perspectives and you know we'd like to really thank them for being there uh, with us throughout this uh, session today. Um, we'd also like to thank you for being a part of this. You know, without you, this would not, not have been. And we really appreciate you spending the time uh, with us here today. And we hope that you would have been inspired, you know, by what you would have heard. And we hope that you can continue to engage and amplify Indigenous people's voices. Too many times our voices are, are not being amplified and we appreciate you making that time, we appreciate you You spending the time and we're asking you and encouraging you to amplify our voices out there. Um, so as you're aware, this session would have been uh, recorded and all of this can be found at uh, ifnotusthenwho.me. You can go to our website and you'll be able to find um, all, this, all the discussions that would have happened here today. 
you'd, you'd be able to find the, the blogs and anything that was associated with this event today. Um, this recording will be made available in due time and we will ensure that there is translations, there are subtitled translations that you can, you can you know, watch it again or you can share with others that they too can be a part of it. So we also like to thank the, the sponsors uh, for this activity and all those who made this possible, like the Tenure Facility, uh, Neotero, the Rainforest Action Network and UN Live Plus and all the organizations who you know, created the super panels, of course, all those who would have participated in making the panels possible, we'd like to say thank you. I know, for example, T. Keenan in his country, it's now after midnight and you know, he's still here with us. So we'd really appreciate uh, the panelists for making the time and effort to, to sit uh, today through this uh, sessions. Um, we believe that um, now is a vital moment in the world and it's a time to really rethink uh, and reframe how we live in our societies. You know, it's a time to act on our climate. It's a time to really, truly belong. If not us, then who? You know, if not now, then when? You know, so if you're moved, if you're moved to support local communities, then you can donate to the Roots That Heal fundraiser and please buy photography prints for communities online and all this information can be found at ourvillage.us. So you can find all this information regarding this at ourvillage.us. Um, before we get into the, the last session, and we know we've spent quite a, a few hours here discussing and you know paying attention, um, but I'd, I'd like to I'd like to sing the song. You might have seen me sitting here with this guitar since we started, um, but it's a song called uh, "Shorty Ecological." It's a Portuguese song, and it's really done like in the memory of uh, Chico Mendes. And I know many of you would know that Chico Mendes was an ecologist, an environmentalist, and he was uh, murdered in 1988. So many of our, our leaders, many of the people who would have you know gone there before, since in 1998, you know we would have had this man uh, Chico Mendes talking about the pollution you know that was happening at the time. So. I just like to share that song and then we will go into some DJ music by DJ Mark, Eric Mark. Yeah. So the song is in Portuguese. No posso respirar, no posso mais nada. A terra está morrendo, não nos levanta. Se plantar não nasce, nasce não dá. A tapinha na boa é difícil encontrar. No posso respirar, no posso mais nada. A terra está morrendo, nada para plantar. Se plantar não nasce, nasce não dá. A tapinha na boa é difícil encontrar. Cadê a flor? Estava aí na poluição, comeu. Peixe do mar, a poluição comeu. E vê de onde está a poluição, comeu. Nem Chico Mendes sobreviveu. Cadê a flor? Estava aí a poluição, comeu. Peixe do mar, a poluição comeu. Vê de onde está a poluição comeu. Tem Chico Mendes sobreviver. So that's the short ecological, and it was you know, done in memory of Chico Mendes. So our next session will be some live music uh, by Eric Tirena. Uh, Eric is, is a DJ, Brazilian DJ, and you know he will take us through another couple of minutes or so. But feel free to enjoy yourselves. You can put on your videos and you know have a lot of fun. So um, much love from all of us, and we hope that you really enjoyed our session. So agora nós vamos ter uns música com DJ Eric Terena. Vamos lá, Eric. Michael. Cadê o DJ? Já tá pronta aí? Toca a música, DJ. Estamos prontos. So, Eric is a young indigenous DJ and he will, you know, take us through uh, with some, some music.
Inspirado na mulher indígena, uma mulher entendedora, que direito é aquilo que se arranca quando não tem mais escolha. O projeto político está enfermo, executou muitos corpos, colonizou muitas mentes e até tentaram nos enterrar, mas não sabia que era um semente. Ser negro indígena é ter cultura, beleza e identidade, é ter o pertencimento à herança da ancestralidade. Na presença ritualística, pulsando firme ao som do tambor do maracá, ao que invoca sua força, seja jurema ou orixá. Essa foi um convite para a sociedade pensar. Sou mulher indígena que se soma muitas lutas, sou séria, chave de amar. Somos indígenas de sabedoria milenar, com vozes fortes às vezes serenas. Denunciamos genocídio através da música com o DJ Eric Terena. <risos> Pensar o passado é necessário para o um futuro melhor poder viver. Tantas coisas erradas foram feitas, destruídas sem pensar no amanhã. Eu não sei na verdade o que dói mais, se é morrer para não ver o triste fim ou viver num presente de lembranças da natureza que foi e não voltará. Acreditar ter esperança não faz mudar o quadro grave impossível reverter, entender que inchar não é crescer e frear essa a falsa evolução Pra que por que tanta tecnologia Se nem os rios aprendemos Preservar Substituir índio por gado Ribeirinho por usina nuclear Mas que tanta injustiça É essa Que inversão de valores também O ser humano não tem mais valor E o meio ambiente Que valor tem Moeda de troca funcionaria Com a natureza que dá Mas tem que receber A indústria sorrida Utopia, e o homem chorando humilhado vai sofrer, vai morrer com os peixes, afogar o rio, inundar a caatinga, esquentar no rio. Morrer com os peixes Afogar o rio Inundar a caatinga Esquentar no rio Repensar o passado é necessário Para um futuro melhor poder viver Tantas coisas erradas foram feitas Destruídas sem pensar no amanhã Eu não sei na verdade o que dói mais Se é morrer pra não ver o triste fim Ou viver num presente de lembranças Da natureza que foi e não voltará Acreditar ter esperança não faz mudar O quadro grave impossível reverter Entender que inchar não é crescer E frear essa falsa evolução Pra que por que tanta tecnologia Se nem os rios aprendemos preservar Substituir em um purgado Ribeirinho por usina nuclear Mas que tanta injustiça é essa Que inversão de valores também O ser humano não tem mais valor e o meio ambiente, que valor tem? Moeda de troca funcionaria com a natureza que dá, mas tem que receber a indústria sorrida, a utopia e o homem chorando humilhado. Vai sofrer, sofrer, sofrer. Vai morrer com peixe. Caro rio. Inundar. A caatinga Esquentar no frio Vai morrer com os peixes 
One more, Eric. <laughs> Mas. Mas. Thank you. <laughs> como está? Como, como, como está por aí, Michael? Você canta muito bem. Obrigado. Estou bem. Estou bem demais. <laughs> Depois eu vou cantar outro. Não, agora não. Depois. Outro tempo. Obrigado. Muito obrigado pela oportunidade. Fico muito feliz. Como estamos de tempo? Continuar. Não tem tempo agora. Pode seguir. Mais, mais. Lagui, lagui, lagui. Mais. Agora sou festa. Chefes das missões diplomáticas dos países membros da comunidade do Caribe. Hey, 
Cacheria lua, iri bem que é culpa, cacheria lua, why now, why now? Iri bem que é culpa, cacheria lua, iri bem que é culpa, cacheria lua, why now, why now? Amplitude para receber a força, a pureza renova o nosso ser criança. Voltei infância sem pensamentos, lembrei que antigamente não existia o tempo. Só levo o necessário na bagagem atento, se entende? Não sigo regra, ando conforme com o vento, sem direção levam palavras obscuras. Daqui a alguns invernos se mostram essas criaturas. A luz guiará seus filhos e o pai já indicará para nós nossos caminhos. Meu seu destino é incerto, só depende de nós ser o seu correto. Queremos um teto pra morar. Resistência pelo nosso lado, incentivar. Andão, filho da chuva, plantar. Iri bem que é culpa, cacheria lua. Iri bem que é culpa, cacheria lua. Why now? Why now? Iri bem que é culpa, cacheria lua. Iri bem que é culpa, cacheria lua. Why now? Why now? Na caminhada, só se aprende errando mesmo A escolha do caminho é você quem faz te vejo No ato, você me traga fato Pra uns faltam, outros se fartam Eu senti fome, dorme que passa As feridas da alma, eu sei que sara Evoluí, não mais mentir Elevação espiritual, eu sei que a luz em ti A luz guiará seus filhos E o pai já indicará pra nós nossos caminhos Meu seu destino é incerto Só depende de nós ser o seu correto Queremos um teto pra morar Resistência pelo nosso lado Incentivar quando eu vi da chuva plantar, e bem que é que o pai cachorro ia luar, e bem que é que o pai cachorro ia luar, vai lá, vai lá, vai lá. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Yay! Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Eric, you're arrasando. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Lindo, Eric. Lindo. Thank you, guys. Thanks for turning up. Thanks for making this amazing. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> hey, Lucas. <laughs> 